Hello and welcome to what has been described by my, one of my co-hosts as the uh, the lockdown special. Yes, Comet Watch is back. Um, we're all back, and in the, uh, in the words of a very infamous person, let's get this show on the road. So, um, sh- my co-host, so let's let's let get you introdu- introduced first, and then our guests can jump in and introduce themselves, and we'll, we'll do the shipping forecast. Uh, I'll go first then. It's uh, Neil Norman. And Mary McIntyre. And obviously I'm Nicky Vetz. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess let's, let's, change, let's, let's change it around a bit. Let's have our guests introduce themselves before the, the forecast. Yeah, Michael Mattiazzo from uh, Swan Hill, Victoria, Australia. And Terry Lovejoy from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. G'day, mate. <sighs> G'day, mates. Okay, so, um, latest, we're going to go over to the visual observations page. I, I really hope, I think everybody has got that up that needs it. So, I'm going to kick off with the latest discoveries. Uh, the 18th of March, Mikhail Kreisioff reports a Kreutz Group comet in real time C3 images. March 23rd, Warshati Bloomplod reports a Kreutz Group comet in real time C3 images. Uh, again on March the 23rd, Masanor Uchina reports a Kreutz Group comet in real-time C2 images. March the 25th, cometary activity confirmed in 2019 U6. March 26th, discovery of 2020 F1 periodic Leonard reported. Uh, again on the 26th, Tree Press Guard report, reports a Kreutz Group comet in real-time C2 images. Okay, I'm just... Uh, March 26 again, watch out boom plots of Kreutz group comet in real time C2 images. And March the 27th, watch out bloom plot reports a Mayer group comet in real time C2 images. Uh, the 28th of March, cometary activity confirmed in 2019 S4. And on the 30th of March, t- Trigo Pestergaard uh, reports four Kreutz group comets in archival C2 images. April the 1st, discovery of 2020 F2 Atlas reported. Uh, the 1st of April, discovery of 2020 F3 Neowise reported. April the 4th, Simon Lai <laughs> Wu reports a Kreutz Group comet in uh, real-time C3 images. Who's next? Mary. Oh. Sorry, I was on mute because I was coughing. <laughs> um, April 6th, the discovery of 2020 F4, which is 2011 GN5 and um, periodic pan stars reported. Uh, 6th of April, discovery of 16th magnitude comets reported by Master in an ATEL. On the 6th, uh, Warchot Bloomprod, April the 6th, that is, uh, Warchot Bloomprod <laughs> reports a Kreutz group comet in real time C2 images. April the 8th, Master Comet designated as 2020 F5. April 8th, again, discovery of 2020 F6 stars reported. On April the 9th, uh, Warchot Boomplot and Masanora Uchino reports a Kreutz Group Comet in real-time C2 images. Um, April the 10th, discovery of 2020 F7A Lemon reported. April the 10th again, and Michael Mattiazzo reports a comet in Swan Images. Congratulations, Michael. Well done, Michael. Thank you, sir. Uh, April the 10th, Warchop Boomplod reports a Kreutz Group comet in real-time C2 images. And April the 12th, Swan report... Desi- uh, sorry, start again. <laughs> April the 12th, Swan comet designated as 2020 F8. Uh, 16th of April, Masanori Uchina reports a Kreutz Group comet in real-time C2 images. April the 17th, the discovery of 2020 G1 P, oh, P for periodic Pimental reported. And of course, on the 17th, the uh, visual observation page was updated. Uh, if there have been no recent updates, um, try the German Comic Group page or Yoshichi Yoshida's page for more information. Or for the Liga, Liga Ibera Americana de Astronomica for observations. <coughs> so, um, now on to Comet 
current comet magnitudes on observable regions on April the 1st. So we'll kick off with 2019 Y1 Atlas magnitude 8 fading question mark 70 degrees north mm -hmm. 25 degrees north uh, evening plus morning objects last visually observed 2020 April. Then we have 2020 F8 Swan, magnitude 8, um, brightening, question mark, observable 0 degrees north to 85 south. That is a morning object. Last visual observation was April 2020. Uh, next is 2017 T2 Pan Stars, magnitude 9 and steady, 70 degrees north to 5 degrees north, and all night objects last reported in April. And 2019 Y4 Atlas, the comet that just gives and gives and gives. <laughs> Magnitude 9.5, bright, 70 degrees north to 10 degrees south all night, and it was the last visually observed April 2020. Then we have 58P Jackson New Gym. That is magnitude 10 question mark, possibly an outburst. Um, observable 20 degrees north to 50 degrees south. That's visible in the early morning and no visual observations reported as yet. Uh, next is 2019 U6 Lemon magnitude 11 and brightening 10 degrees north to 75 degrees south. An evening object last reported in April. 88P. Um, Howell, 13th magnitude question mark, bright, 60 degrees north to 70 degrees south, best at midnight and not yet observed. Then we have 2018 N2 Assassin, uh, magnitude 13 and fading, uh, it's observable 70 degrees north to 55 north, uh, that is best in the morning, last visually observed in January 2020. <laughs> Next is our old friend 29P Schwachmann Wagman, I think. Uh, magnitude 13 question mark, but it varies, of course. It's currently at port elongation and was last seen in February. And finally, but not least, uh, 2020 F3 Neowise, 13.5 magnitude, bright, 10 degrees north to 85 degrees south. It's an evening object. Last observed 2020 April. Now, obviously, the observable region is an approximate indication of the latitude in which a comet may be seen. Uh, obviously, under good conditions, comets are visible outside this range. Uh, the period when visible for the UK, well, the period when visible is for the UK. Um, if the comet is visible from the UK, otherwise for 40 degrees or the south or the equator is appropriate. Um, the last visual observation is as received by the comet section and Jonathan Shanklin, of course. Charts are often updated on the basis of... Um, observations published elsewhere. Now obviously beginners will often find comets fainter than about seven magnitude difficult to locate. Please do go to the comet section website, uh, web page rather, and there are plenty of positions and finder charts available. Well, having said that of course, the, the highlight <coughs> on the website, the, the, the top piece of news is our good friend Michael here, um, mm -hmm. who reported a swan oh, thank comet. You, sir. I have indeed, I have indeed. But before I, before I mention about that, I'll just go through the um, current comet magnitudes as of, yeah. say, the, uh, today, which is the 18th. Um, why, why one atlas seems to have had a bit of an outburst? We'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a moment. Um, I think it was reported at MAG 7 over the past couple of days. Um, uh, use 2009 and U6 Lemon, I've, I've got that at magnitude 10.2 on the... On the 16th, um, so that's showing very good promise. Um, and the other one was 2020 F3 Neowise. I got that about May 12.2 on the uh, 16th as well. So, so the, these things we'll discuss in a moment. But we seem to have a, a heck of a lot of activity, which is which is a long time coming. <laughs> about time we had some, something exciting to look forward to. Visually wise, so the next three months are going to be a very impressive period for, uh, for the comet enthusiast. So uh, yeah, so just so you, you want to hear about my discovery on Swan 2020 F8. Um, it was around the the ninth of April. Um, I was uh, just had a well. Obviously, this lockdown has given me the opportunity to do astronomy. Um, I, normally, I work in the pathology industry. Pathology industry. Um, and people would think that pathology services would be through the roof, but unfortunately, unfortunately, it's um, it's actually cut our outpatient workload by a significant amount. So I've been 
I've been forced to take a bit of um, annual leave, so I've had a um, I've had a couple of couple of weeks off. So it's given me plenty of time to uh, play around with my new instrument. I've got a C11 Rasa on a, on a Skywatcher mount, um, but uh, but yeah, I've I've been a regular a regular scanner of the Swan data. Uh, so any, anyone's capable of doing it. You just need to. Uh, you need you need plenty of patience and plenty of experience to, to look at the data, because uh, there's quite a lot of false positives due to its low resolution, and uh, and the background sources, especially in the Milky Way area. So the the Swan is a camera on board Soho, and it's um, it's it scans the entire sky in uh, ultraviolet light. Now comets uh, when they approach the sun they shine brightly in UV, due to the uh, the Lyman Alpha emission of uh, yeah, ionised hydrogen when uh, when the water ice gets sublimated. So, but, but it's very, very low resolution. So that's one of the keys is finding finding the the, uh, the true candidate in all the garbage. And then once you think you've found that candidate, you can then, um, the second challenge is to find it in the sky. So at, and the data is usually posted about three days behind the schedule. So, so even if you do think you've found something, um, th this object was uh, visible from, say, about the 1st of April. So there were a few point data points already. Mm -hmm. um, so you could sort of draw a line between those points and sort of estimate where it might be in the sky. Uh, but unfortunately, I had a cloudy weather the following morning, so I wasn't able to, to follow it up. So I had to post it onto the comments mailing list to try and get somebody else to help out. Um, and, um, and Martin Massick in the... In the um, uh, he used um, a remote telescope in Argentina to to detect it, which was fantastic. So he was able to confirm it for us. Um, so yeah, that's the that's the big advantage of remote scopes these days. Very useful tools for the astronomical community. Um, and just and yeah, basically we we got that uh, got that hit once it, once it's posted on the possible com confirmation page. It uh, Everyone's aware of it, and they start honing their scopes onto it. So after a couple of days of data, you can get a reasonable orbit established. So it looks like this comet is going to uh, approach the sun um, at closest on the 27th of May at 0 0.43 astronomical units. Um, but it will have a little close past to the Earth um, a bit earlier on the 13th of May at 0 0.55 astronomical units. Um, this, this was my eighth discovery credit since uh, 2004 for Swan Swan Data. Um, I've been I've been looking at it since that time. So caught quite a few in the earlier earlier days, but uh, a lot less nowadays because all, all these all these things tend to get picked up by the by the surveys. Um, mm -hmm. But we if we are lucky in the southern hemisphere at this point in time. I don't believe there's any. Um, any professional surveys going on at the moment until Atlas comes online in Chile um, in next year, so in 12 months' time. So I think the Southerners have got a really good opportunity this year to to find it, to do an amateur find, not cheat like me and use a satellite, but to but use the hard, <laughs> do the hard yard, yeah. use your own scope. So if this lockdown continues, maybe I might have some spare time up my sleeve. That's if the wife agrees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now has has. I was going to say, Michael, has this comet got um, a fairly good orbit yet? Have the eccentricity been worked out? Is this a Oort cloud comet? Do we know? That's, or just, yeah, that's the know? other question too. Yeah, I, I don't, I, does Terry know? I'm not sure. Um, I don't. Um, I, I do yeah. have some observations. I haven't submitted yet astrometry, but um, I don't think so. I think it's too early. Yeah, still, still mm. a bit too early. But that will, yeah. But you're right. That will determine whether this thing is going to survive or not. Because if, if it is, if it is periodic, yeah. then it's got a much much better chance of survival than if, than if it were a a a, um, a dynamically new one. So yeah, because it's going to be quite good for us up north as well. It's going to be very low. Yeah. In, you know, I, I am I am I am a bit concerned though because um, it it showed quite quite rapid brightening um, over two weeks from eleven. 11 to 8 in three weeks, that's, that's like a full magnitude in a week. Uh, but yeah. it seems to have gone a bit flat 
in the past week. I would have expected it to be 7-0 by now, but, um, yeah, it's not, not quite showing that. So I suspect it may have had a bit of an outburst because even, like, I was the first time I saw it, I was getting a DC of 5, but then a the few, few mornings later it was a bit bit weaker. So I suspect it, it might be an outbursting type gassy comet. Yeah. Yeah, well, gassy yeah. comets, when they, when they outburst, they just sort of they'll blow up and then they'll take... They'll, they'll take a dive in a in a day or two. They're they're very quick at going up and back. Uh, as, yeah, opposed to uh, dusty, as opposed to dusty outbursts, when you get a dusty one, it's, they're usually very very um, you know, they're there for a long time, weeks. As as which is what's happening with 50AP, and I'll just discuss that later. Yeah. What was surprising about um, this one, Michael? So on the, on the um, 11th of April, I um, I had a clear night here. We, we I got some views of it here, but it actually showed up in um, in my little Olympus camera, you know, twenty second exposure. So uh, it's hard to imagine a comet being um, that bright for very long without being discovered. Mm, very much. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so you know, your flare um, flare speculation might be right. <laughs> So, uh, oh, and also, what you also notice with, um, with gassy comets, when they do flare, they'll have a very nice, beautiful uh, tail to image, and then all of a sudden that tail's gone, and nothing's yeah. happening anymore. It dies. <laughs> it dies. So, so a good. So, if you get an image of a of a comet with a nice tail on it, you know it's um, you know it's been active recently. Because iron tails yeah. are very, very um, fickle; they disappear very quickly. They don't. Yeah. Um, they don't get sustained. Yes. As opposed to dust tails there, they, you know, they, they hang around and linger. Well, looking at the information that on this side of the world, um, it's, it may be possible to observe it from the UK from about mid-May. It m might be a, a binocular object. Uh, I'm seeing predictions of third magnitude. I'm not going to hold mm. my breath, really. Um, it's like every, no. Comets are like every... every like, the usual things. They have tails and they do with them as they wish. I had to get that one to make Dave really <coughs> happy. <laughs> um, <but laughs> the, thing, the thing is, though, <coughs> predicting um, an naked eye comet or one that may be a spectacular object to binoculars, it's a very iffy thing. And to be honest, <coughs> it really causes problems because the public get hyped up, at, like Atlas is doing mm. at the moment. Um, and well, then they well, get disappointed. Yeah. Yep. Comets are like a box of chocolates. You never know <laughs> what you're going to get. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Had to go okay, to the forest. Okay, forest. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean... I mean, you know, we've got this this uh, Y4 thing up here in the north, and I, I've looked at it um, through 20 by 80 binoculars. It was a lovely object, and then as soon as we had to cut the cloudy nights, the thing started disintegrating. Um, it's just a... a what did you call it, Terry? You said it's like a bag full of shot or something, didn't you? Was, I think you said, you're, to try and quote you, Y4. You sure I said that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't uh, still be polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's shot. Uh, I'm one of the that, that it was Yeah, it was, I said shot. I didn't say anything else. Um, <laughs> but it is, yes, we. <laughs> it's still going though, isn't it? Even though it's it's, it's fighting, still, it's uh, a little fighter, but it's it's been knocked out. It's you know it's it's on the floor, but it's getting up. But it's probably going to get back knocked yeah. back down again. <laughs> it will disintegrate. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just, I don't know. See when it gets close to the sun, I'd be interested to see what happens to that primary nucleus. So I think yeah. there's still a fair bit of mass left in that primary nucleus. So we will see. It's one, one thing it if you ask me, ask me for a prediction of it at this point, <laughs> I'd have no idea. You know, I could do anything. Yeah, yeah, I, I still think. I still think that primary's not not strong enough. Uh, I, I still reckon it's going to completely disintegrate. But but having said that, if um, it just takes me back to 1999 S4 linear, um, that did the same sort of thing. That that uh, that was predicted to get to the naked eye, but it 
it failed in the end. It cracked up spectacularly. Um, but it, but it was a really nice sight. It was a, it was just a beautiful cigar shaped object. So, and I'm sure we'll get to see something like that in in May. The Northerners will get to see it. Um, particularly mm. at that point, um, you're going to get a high phase angle with the sun, and dust tails yeah. really show up nicely with the with the phase angle. So it's, so it'll be a very it'll be quite a bright quite a bright dusty debris trail. That you'll uh, get to get to view visually, probably not naked eye, but you know, be nice binocular object. <clears throat> that's my. I was just wondering. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I've been trying to do like you know, look at the research from the its parent or its sibling from the, you know the Great Comet of eighteen forty three or whatever it was, four, and four. um, I. 84, sorry, uh, 44, sorry, yeah. And I just, you know, this it just suddenly seemed to appear from nowhere. I haven't seen anything, you know, documented saying it, you know, was picked up before it done perihelion and then suddenly was, you know, had a 10 degree tail in a twilight sky from the southern Yeah, so that's, so. yeah, that may have cracked itself. We don't know. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah presumably that's probably cracked at perihelion and it's suddenly brightened up real quick. But, yeah, but then they then you would have thought they may have noticed that in telescopes if it had. But sh but sure as hell, the original body fragmented what, some five thousand years ago or whatever. Um, yeah, and, and we now, now know that this this thing is a smaller is the smaller fragment. Unfortunately, we were hoping it was going to be the bigger one. <laughs> it was yeah. it was pretending to be the bigger one, particularly in mm. February when it was about. It was showing at 12th Mag in February and then 8th Mag in March. There were predictions that it would be. Yeah. There were predictions uh, a month ago that it was going to get to about minus 20. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, bright yeah. as the sun, as bright as bright the moon, sun. as bright as Venus, yep. uh, yeah. zero <laughs> magnitude, six magnitude. But uh, yeah, well, mm -hmm. I, think, I think the actual, it's beaten, it's beaten everybody's guesstimate and it's doing nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's... Um... Uh, it still uh, annoys me a little bit, though, that, that, that the same people, the same um, websites and the same people that basically get up <laughs> and predict, yeah, it's going to be magnitude minus five. And uh, the common, <laughs> the common um, <laughs> one was to pick up the, the horizons predictions, which is the JPL yeah. horizon predictions. And they oh, had this up. And they're notoriously bad, yeah, uh, yes, un unreliable for comet predictions. And uh, I think they had negative five in there. And I, I thought we were being optimistic, Michael, at negative two. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very true, very true. And it turns out people are pushing conservative predictions for um, as minus five in some <laughs> cases. Mm. I and, thought it uh, would sort of like hang around the lines of L4, 2011 L4 Pansar. So I thought it was going to be a similar magnitude to that, you know, sort of like one, two, zero at best sort of thing. I didn't think it would be anything great as yeah. such. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they, these, um, this is such <laughs> a common story. You just think people should learn. Yeah. Um, I don't do. Uh, uh, and it goes back to... Um, you know, Comet Kurtek, which was in 73, which actually was a really nice comet. Um, mm. But I think the start of that... Yeah, I think the start of that is that there were a, um, a couple of predictions came out. Um, I think Brian Marsden got a bit burnt over that. Um, so Brian used to head up the Central Bureau of Astronomical telegrams and um he i think he had there was two sets of predictions one more conservative and one with a, with a more optimistic but less likely and i think mm -hmm. obviously people picked up the more optimistic the optimistic one and when you yeah. look when you look back and you actually look at comet Kutek, <clears throat> it actually performed you know reasonably well for a long period mm. comet uh yeah. And had it not been subjected to that hype, it'd be better remembered, I would think. Yeah, um, definitely. Same thing happened with Halley, too. So yeah. predictions came out, Halley would peak at magnitude 4, which is not that impressive. 
Um, it actually peaked at close to the magnitude too, yet people still see it as a flop. Yeah, yeah, and particularly when they most of them people were observing in the bright cities with bright, uh, bright light pollution. Well, yeah, so mm. that was it's, the thing. It, um, everybody knew it wasn't going to be a particularly brilliant return, uh, and we all know that the next one is even worse. Um, mm. But the thing is, actually, no, is that, I thought it was going to be better actually. Um, last time I Better checked, Perry Hill, yeah. Yeah, because it's we, yeah, it should be should be a good one actually in twenty sixty one. The the thing with the Hall, Hallie though is the tail. One thing we we noticed at the remember discussing at the time was the tail. Um, mm. the dust tail isn't as bright as say some of the great comets like Bennett and uh, West. So. Uh, even then, it, it may, even at a good return, it may be considered pretty disappointing. So, you know, it's about expectations, you know, because because it's Halley, I think people expect it to be the, the largest, brightest comet. <laughs> mm -hmm. I never did find it. I was a young kid with no astronomy mentors, and I remember every morning getting CFAX up on the telly and looking at Halley Watch, <coughs> and it had the star chart with this big kind of graphic of the comet and I was out every night mm. looking and I obviously didn't see it because I didn't even have binoculars so <laughs> I don't think I was mm. ever going to stand a chance but you know it's always uh, irked me that I missed it <coughs> last time so I hope I'm still here next time yeah it was yeah. A, wasn't a bad little comet actually Ellie um uh we get well, me hooked. Hooked. stories. <laughs> <laughs> I was well down down here, Michael. I don't know if you remember, but um, uh, with, with Halley, and again, this was expectations. The predictions were that it would be uh, best in uh, mid early April, March or April, yeah. And uh, so a, a lot of people actually flew down from the northern hemisphere to see it. In um, around that April, mm. early eleventh approach time, yeah, April eleventh, yeah. And, and what actually happened was the tail, um, the dust tail was pointing uh, away from the Earth. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the dust tail actual uh, perspective meant that we, we, we got a good view of the dust the tail dust. <laughs> in March, and then yeah. as I, as it got close to the Earth, what nobody anticipated was the dust tail was pointing almost directly away from, okay. from us. <laughs> so and, then it in May, like, and then in May it started And then and then when everyone went home degrees. when everyone, <laughs> everyone went back to uh the northern <laughs> hemisphere the, the tail closed back up and we got a fantastic views of the comet again in late April and <laughs> May. Well it's all it's all a matter of perspective. <laughs> From it's all a matter I, of mm. From what I understand about the 2061 apparition, <laughs> um, it's it's supposed to be at its cro closest approach to Earth um, around July 28th or 29th. Um, yep. So it will be then north, which is which for the people listening to this will be above the plane of the Earth's orbit. So it will be some 21 degrees north to the Sun. That's the current some of the current predictions. Um, mm. Whether or not it will. Give it will provide a spectacular light show. Um, is, yeah, at least the, the advantage here, though, is, as a matter of perspective, the dust tail will actually be pointing towards Earth this time. Mm. So, so we'll get a get a lot better uh, phase angle out of it. So it it will be a lot nicer view than it than it was in eighty six for sure. Well, eighty six wasn't too bad for me because I live in a rural area, um, so it was marginally better. Um, I know people in London who were really, um, I suppose we can use the phrase bummed, I suppose, um, because <laughs> there'd, there'd been all the hype and people just didn't rea don't realise that sometimes a comet doesn't switch on <clears throat> and provide a spectacular show. But uh, mm. I, I worked on, on some, I worked on a couple of the, the bits and pieces that went on the Giotto. Um, so it was a case of when that, particularly when that apparate, that encounter happened, um, we were all summoned into work. We were in the in, in the boardroom, and uh, we had multiple feeds. So 
we, we had the best of both worlds really uh, we, we had Patrick um, doing his bit uh, and then we had um, the feed coming in raw from the European Space Agency so mm. getting some interesting <coughs> stuff and of course I think I actually watched that um, live on TV and I, I actually I remember to this day Patrick <coughs> um, I think was got a bit perplexed when the first um, Giotto images mm. came through because they came through in um, like a false a posterized yeah, yeah, false, false colour false false colour, colour. And you, yeah. you couldn't really tell what was what. Or where, the, where the nucleus the was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had no idea what you were looking at. <laughs> I still remember that very uh, distinctly. Um, there was a lot of confusion over the first images. Uh, um, well, I, I think the thing is, though, this was probably the first time we'd actually managed to get a space probe up to a comet. Um, that was yes. passing, we, yeah. and uh, of course, <clears throat> with uh, CG, what? Oh God, I can't remember it. The Russian one. <laughs> <laughs> the Russian oh, that, Vega. 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 Yeah. yeah the, 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 the probes. The Vega probes. Well, I was still more thinking yeah. of the actual uh, CGs. I can't remember the numbers. Um, and Rosetta. Um, that built so much on uh, Giotto, the Vegas, and. Japan sent, I think, a couple of its own space probes. Yeah, yeah. Suisei and yeah, Sanigaki. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was really, uh, it really laid the foundations for, for Rosetta to happen and for the Comet Interceptor mission, um, which is currently being built for deployment into Lagrange Point so that the next time there is a, a decent comet or, or even one that's going to be interceptable, we can get to it. We can do some really. We can build on what we learned from Rosetta, and it's really thinking about it. Eighty, the eighties for Giotto. Uh, it's not really that long, time-wise. When you think about it, we, we've taken huge mm -hmm. steps. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, would it be nice to go back to, to Hawley's comet? Absolutely. Um, we, we've learned um, not to um, protect the camera. We'll do that next time. I remember that we that when that hit happened, that dust particle hit the camera. Uh, it was like, okay, that's a lesson we're going to have to learn. Expensive, but we learned it. But the the pro went to to Skrig, um, Skeller up, and it still did science, and that was really yep. through a lot of people because. That mission wasn't talked about in, until um, we knew that we could, that the intercept could be done, uh, and that there was actually going to be a science data feed coming off it. And then, of course, it, it went public, and again, Giotto became the little probe that can do. Um, this shows you how well we build stuff. Look at the word. Yeah. Look at uh, look at Soho, Michael, and Swan. Yeah. 18, 18 month service life, nineteen ninety five, when it was yep. sent up, mm -hmm. designed yeah. for eighteen months, and here we are in twenty twenty. Yeah, it's the most important, <laughs> it's uh, the most important <laughs> satellite up there, I believe, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> but I, would, I wouldn't mind, a, I wouldn't mind an updated camera to the Swan, an updated UV camera. That's what we need. Yeah. Irish pick, pick comets to fifteenth magnitude or something like that. Super fun. You know, you know, um, one of the predecessors, uh, the Solwyn, was actually shot out of the sky by um, as part yeah, of the American the Star, Star Wars, Wars Star Wars project. project yeah, Reagan. So yeah, they were testing anti-satellite uh, technology, and they they chose um, Solwyn, which found. How many comets? Six or so? Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Quite a shame. Should have left it out there. Yep. yep. There's another, um, the NeoWise, the, the WISE satellite, which is now NeoWise, they've, um, they've, uh, it's the, that's infrared. Um, mm. They've discovered a comet 2020 F3, which, um, mm. which looks quite promising. <coughs> Because uh, that's that's uh, 
that's going to be close to the sun on the 3rd of July at 0.29 astronomical units. So that's mm. a very, very nice perihelion distance. Um, yeah, and again, it's going to come north. And then it's going to, yeah. Watch, yeah, that's basically good for good for you northerners because uh, yeah. after that, after perihelion, it will have an Earth approach on the uh, a couple of weeks later at uh, 0.69 AU. So it should, um, that's got very good naked eye potential there. Um, yeah, I've got that at Mag 12 with a, with a quite a big coma. Uh, yeah, we're looking yes. at yeah, about four arc minutes or so. So it's looking uh, yeah. quite interesting. I think I yeah. got a shot of that on the uh, 15th. And if I stretch the the image, it's definitely, uh, I don't know, I'd say probably five arc minutes. Five arc minutes, coma. yeah. Yep, as of Actually, as I'm, of I'm, uh, yeah mid April. I'm bringing it up mm. on the screen now. It's just loading. Yeah. And I have a look, but uh, <laughs> yeah, so, <laughs> so. yeah, absolute magnitude of that would be uh, well. It's, this is the question: Is it going to survive its perihelion of 0.29? Um, yeah. So we, we're so, going to need something uh, on the order of an absolute mag of eight or yeah. better. I think it's about that, so I'm, I'm putting it about absolute magnitude 8 with a third power of brightening. So, yeah, it's getting up to about five arc minutes there. Four or five. Yep. Mm. Maybe five. So potentially so, uh, large. Do we know uh, this is a cloud job or...? Uh, yeah, oh, that's, that's the to... other question too. Um, I've got a, I've got an E of point nine 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 five five zero seven, so potentially oh, it's that's closed. Encouraging. That's in, yeah. slightly encouraging. Definitely. But, but we need to know the uh, one over A of the original orbit to yeah to be to be certain. Um, yeah. Bear with me, and I'll, I'll I'll have a look and see if it is. But but either way, <laughs> it's still a um. <laughs> A potential there's a naked eye. There's, there's a few naked potential naked eyes, um, in, including which, which is quite surprising because I've, I've, I've looked at Seiichi Yoshida's um, website and he's, he's got a fantastic, <coughs> fantastic website mm. at the airth.net. Yeah. He's also predicting that um, that 2019 U6 lemon is going to peak at mag five and a half, which is mm. which is oh. a bit brighter, a bit brighter than what I. What I <laughs> what I was expecting, I was probably thinking it might get the binocular range mag seven or something in in June July. Yeah, it's going to get you, you. Your northerners will get to see it in July. It'll be a southern object right. in June. I think around that. Uh, I think in July. I think late in July, there's a uh, three of the objects are fairly close together. So yeah, there's C two thousand and 19U6, which we're just talking about. Uh, there's Neowise, the other one we were just discussing, yep. and 2017 T2. I think in a fairly small area of sky. Yep. Yep. So yeah. that'll be interesting. Three T2's bright nice comets in the same field of the sky. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> T2 is a nice comet to look at in binoculars already. Um, I, I saw it the other night because it's. Not too far away from Y four, so I just scanned across, and it was it looked really nice. It seems to it seems to have had less uh, attention, hasn't it? Yeah, and that I mean I remember we watched the sky at night in December, and uh, Pete Lawrence was saying that you know that was our, at that time it was going to be our best potential comet for twenty twenty because Y four hadn't been discovered at that point, and now all of a sudden we've got a Swan comet, we've got, you know we've got everything just happening within a space of three, three months. months. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, crazy world, <laughs> and, and we can both share them, which is good. So now let's not blame comets on viruses. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, we, well, so I must admit, there's a lot of jumping on the bandwagon of the Y four thing. I must admit, the public. Uh, I mean, I've seen um, a report the other day. You've probably seen it too from a certain newspaper in England, definitely. That uh, oh. you know, Y four five times size of the sun or something like this 
<laughs> oh, that was the, uh, yeah, that was the it, daily. I think no, I saw that. Yeah. The daily yeah. film. Yeah. No, there was somebody saying it was yeah, some ten right. times bigger than Jupiter somewhere as well. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, that's probably right. But but we're looking at a bit extremely faint extended outer coma. That's what they don't put in, you see. That's the bit that doesn't yeah, get yeah. the public's attention. No, it's going to light up the sky. It's not a solid sky. object. It's not a solid object. <laughs> I, I actually yeah. re rewrote the first paragraph of that, that news article for a friend who was... <laughs> Who, who who saw this article, sent it through to me, and said, "What do you think about this?" Wow! And I so I rewrote the um, the first paragraph and sent it back. <laughs> said, "Oh, okay. Yeah, that, that's that's a different story altogether." <laughs> I think I replaced um, um, brighter than Venus with. Uh, uh, <laughs> Possibly visible in binoculars, provided you know exactly where to look. <laughs> yeah. I, I think the the biggest problem is the the the, um, the idiots who write these stories. They don't know. They they assume that what they're seeing is the nucleus. They they don't know. They don't appreciate that there is a faint outer gas shell, which is what we're, mm -hmm. which is see it visible um but the nucleus to all intent and purpose is pretty much hidden um and they, they get it all confused they think what we're seeing is the nucleus uh, and that's why yeah. they they they're pushing for a for a very bright comet um pers <clears throat> personally i i think we we, sh we should allow the public to do certain unmentionable things to said journalists for fake news stories but uh, yeah well the, the other the thing the, is the others the the other tactic, sorry, of course. On. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was going to say one of the no, tactics no, no. is to present both uh, the yeah. conservative, the conservative, um, yeah. or the or the more realistic yeah. <laughs> uh, outcome, and then a, and then an unreasonable, um, optimistic prediction, and then downplay the realistic, and then upplay the the um, the optimistic prediction. And that seems to be a a big part of it but I don't know I would have thought magnitude minus two is fairly optimistic for this comet Michael <laughs> let alone well, yeah. minus especially, five or minus especially now <laughs> I think magnitude <laughs> six is going to be optimistic <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think the most optimistic yeah. prediction I thought <laughs> saw for this was minus 27.7 <laughs> <laughs> love it <laughs> and, and if that that ever that happened, uh, we'd have more than the coronavirus to worry about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Did you guys yeah, see the story about the two comets that were going to collide and that's why one had broken up and it was going to send them both crashing towards Earth and, uh, oh, yeah. face palm. <laughs> oh, good oh, enough, the, the, I know. Oh, actually, I've got, to mention, I've got to mention Chris Wyatt here. I know he's going to be listening somewhere in Australia. <laughs> Chris Wyatt is going to have to go now to his shed, so tag him in this, get him to go to his shed and get out all that ice and sun cream that he had from 2013. <laughs> He's got a bucket load of it, knock it out for next to no money. It's probably gone off now. But when this thing hits minus 27, he's going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll probably start on bottom five and things, won't it? And things... I mean, but the thing is, what's so annoying is that people have spent so much money, time and effort to land on comets, 67p, to go through comets, Halley or Hawley, I should say, and the journalists do not listen to the science. They still have these spectacular Hollywood uh, rubbish things <clears throat> and all this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, all this science has been done, money, effort, time, hours and hours and hours and they still don't learn look listen it's just so annoying it's just clickbait though isn't it they know they don't care that they get it wrong because it's every click is revenue so they literally yeah. do not give a hoot that they've got it wrong no. uh, that, 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 that just just doesn't happen with uh, the astronomy community it's really bad with um other interests like photography groups so Mm. It's quite appalling what happens 
Well, because uh, people realise that clickbait is revenue, and if you get um, yeah. uh, more clicks, and controversy um, creates clicks, and sensationalisation yeah. creates mm-hmm. clicks. Um, so I can tell you in the photography community, you know, there's a couple of YouTubers that have million plus subscribers that are just presenting nonsense uh, and yeah and often contra- often putting out controversial information or incorrect inf- information and, and getting people worked up and you know people want to get it, get on there and and comment but it, you know it's all clickbait yeah the worst thing is, I, I've even seen a certain body that begins with the letter N um, mm. being referred to. That uh, this, it's, it's all down to this particular body, which I'm not going to mention. Uh, I'm sure. I'm sure our <laughs> learned listeners will know I'll, exactly I'll, what. I'll put, I'm just putting down N now. I've got to go through all my Ns. <laughs> <laughs> so it's the biggest pseudo fake science solar system story on the planet. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yes, that one. Um, you know, the one real, that, that Duck no, Bill sure has X nice. marks the spot. Yeah, Get it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway. We've got it. <clears throat> it it's, it's, that's come back in. I've seen some stories going around about that. And the, yeah. the, that particular body is influencing the comet to shatter and rain down. And I'm thinking, oh, my. Yeah, this, right. this is where I, I really, really, really want um, the USS Enterprise, so I can just find them, beam them up, <laughs> and beam them out into space, yeah. and be done with it. <laughs> oh, fake news. Yeah. It's like that American leader says, it's fake news. Fake yeah. news. Fake news. Fake news. Once, the, uh, once the large synoptic <laughs> space telescope comes online, they'll, they'll be able to you know, identify Find objects it. of 25th magnitude and... We'll, we'll have mapped. We'll have mapped the entire Kuiper Belt, and we'll have mapped all the biggest comets out there, etc. Yeah. So we'll have a fair idea of what's really out there, and we'll be able to say fine. yay or nay with with certainty with certainty that that it exists or it does not exist. <laughs> well, yeah, because it mathematically it exists. This is not that particular body, but another one. Um, called Planet Nine, mm-hmm. which the mathematicians say does exist, because of per- perturbations um, in the Kuiper Belt of of um, trans Neptune objects. Now, yes, yes, mathematics is brilliant. Yes, it, it predicted Uranus, it predicted Neptune, but yeah. this object would have to be so massive and so dim um, in order to perturb comets and send them into the into the inner system and we are talking about something that is probably going to make minor adjustments that's going to take millennia to be affected mm-hmm. so if you're listening to this don't worry even if they do find planet nine it's not going to affect you the only thing it might affect is any future um, ability to engage warp drive in the solar system <laughs> Did I read somewhere that it might possibly be um, many bodies that all together make up the total mass rather than well, being dwarf planets? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm sure planets. I saw there was a, yeah, a theory about that rather than it being one big body. Well, as I say, some people are saying it's just one massive gas giant that's out there, yeah. um, but it could. We don't know the Kuiper Belt. Yeah actually extends halfway to the next star so we are talking about something very far out and if it is that far out um, <clears throat> it's, it's going to be very difficult and as to affecting comets in, in the inner Kuiper belt um, I, I'm, I'm not sold on the idea but I did ask actually Mike Brown because um, that's the guy who basically was in front of this sort of thing about when we had the, the you know the two I Borisov the interstellar comet. I asked him if there was a, a possibility that his uh, planet, we we'll call it his for you know for want of another word, had perturbed a comet way out in the Oort cloud and thrown it in at such a you know trajectory that it's. But they did actually look at it, and um, they it did the mathematics and said no, it couldn't have been that. But they it seriously when I asked him the question. <laughs> so this, you yeah, know, there's, um, yeah, I, I did see somebody wrote up 
Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm forgetting the source now, but they did actually do quite a detailed analysis, all the, all the different possibilities, and, and reeled them out one by one and gave very good reasons why. And that was one of the yeah one of the options was that there was some large body out there that could actually perturb and when you looked at the reasoning it was pretty solid and yeah. it was unlikely to have been thrown in so you know the by far the most likely scenario was uh, an interstellar comet yeah mm. For all, for all we know, it could be. There, we know that there are rogue, there are planets that just seem to wander wander around the galaxy, uh, unattached to any yeah. particular star. It could have been one of those um, that, in the far distant past, um, had a very very close po past to the solar system. Um, that's perturbed some of the comet, the long period <coughs> comets certainly, that have been yeah. recorded. Um, it may even be an explanation. Um, for why Hawley's comet was sent into the system and that is on its current trajectory. But then again, Jupiter affects everything. Um, <coughs> we, um, it either deflects them or it uh, sucks them up, or if it's in a really mean mood, it sends them into the mm. inner solar system. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting one, that, that, uh, that new comet uh, master, was, was it? That's going to... Yeah. Yeah. Approach very close to Jupiter next year this time. Right. Okay. Is that the right? Is that the correct comet? I'm just trying to think. I don't know that. Could master, be master. master. Yeah. yeah. Let me Google that so, for yeah, you. When, when it, when it, when it, <laughs> yeah. When it does, uh, when it, when it does encounter Jupiter, it should affect its orbit quite significantly and turn it into a periodic object. Mm. Yeah. Well, not I'm only pretty that. Pretty sure it's, yeah. Not only that, if if it gets captured and becomes a short period comet, we were really <coughs> lucky. In. Um, well, yeah. So who knows? Touch wood. Uh, we might we might get something decent out of it. Maybe. Yeah, but I, uh, don't might... <coughs> I was going to say fifty eight fifty eight p Jackson Jackson Newman. How do you, how do you pronounce that? Is it Newman or Neumann? Neumann, I think. Neumann, mm, yes, it looks Dutch. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That object um, that hasn't been seen since 1996, and it was missed, missed at its last couple of returns, and that was identified uh, by by um, um, Hua Su in, uh, in Swan data. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I was able to follow that one up and image it. And it's... Um, yeah, it looks like it was 10th magnitude, so it's, um, and it was about two days out out of prediction. Uh, it's low in the eastern morning sky. Um, so it's actually, it looks like it's in outburst, so yeah. whether, it's, whether it's starting to crumble into pieces as well. So maybe in the next, I think uh, it's going to peak <coughs> peak at about magnitude 10 next, uh, next month in May. So Will that come north as well? well I'm, I haven't looked at that one. I must admit. <laughs> the altitude, the altitude will be in the morning sky, quite quite low in the morning still, but I think it's all slow, steadily improved as the as okay. the month progresses. So yeah, should be oh. worth a look. I wonder, I wonder if it's um, broken into pieces. It looks it looks odd on my images. It looks right. like a very dust dusty uh, circular patch. So, yeah, so I've got a big look. tree in the way of that at the moment. Yeah. So I can't get onto that. <laughs> It's only about ten degrees altitude. It's quite low. Yeah. Well, it's kind of ironic. I just, I've, I've got a new telescope here. My, my uh, C10 is in the state still. Um, so I've now got a 16-inch dob, which I'm hoping eventually to fit out with Go2. So, um, and it's, uh, I, I got quite a shock. Uh, David um, Levy has exactly the same scope. So. Uh. But, but you don't find as many comets as he did. Oh no 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 not yet. I haven't <laughs> got go to on it yet, Neil. Oh, do it the old-fashioned way. Move it about. <laughs> do it to the back of the hammer. <laughs> yeah. We've got oh, a ten-inch Dobsonian. I love it for comets, just for visual. 
I've mm. done a bit of imaging with that scope, but it's easier to set the others up than that one, so we don't use it very much. But it's great. I love that sort of scope. Because you loved the um, Q4 of Terry's, didn't you, Mary? I did. That was you. Uh, yeah. Did you have a tattoo done of that? Uh, might have. I think you had a tattoo. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought. All the secrets that are coming out on tonight's show. Yes. Oh, there you go, Terry. Top Gear. You uh, put it before. <laughs> uh, Mary, I think, actually posted that on Facebook, so I think that yeah. is... Well, there you go, Terry. <laughs> there you go. <coughs> you have to send an any, autograph or something. I haven't got any uh, tattoos yet. But, uh, what of Mary? <laughs> <laughs> that I think you should weird. return the compliment, surely. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that would be really strange, wouldn't it? Yeah. It would be odd, but... This is the strange time we live in, Terry. A strange time. <laughs> well, I've only got one tattoo I'm thinking about, and it's a, a physics diagram. So. Oh God, they're all pretty boring. <laughs> it's a penguin. It's a Feynman penguin diagram, um, and it is uh, for. Feynman penguin. <coughs> Feynman <coughs> penguin diagram. Uh, mm -hmm. a, one of the physicists that came after Richard um, had a bet. And he lost it. Yeah. And oh. the deal with the bet was, if he lost the bet, he would have to find a way to use the word penguin in his paper. Uh, so oh. what he did, he actually created a new subset of Feynman diagrams, which if mm. you superimpose um, a penguin on it, it does look like a penguin. Wow. Um, so, as I say, there is one that shows the... the the temporary change in quarks to anti-quarks and back, which I have actually got my eye on as being a possible tattoo. Only, th only the one on my arm up near the top shoulder, but uh, nice. that will be nice. completely different, and uh, you won't get me. Into, you shouldn't get me into as much trouble as putting uh, somebody else's name on there. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Michael, have you got any of your? Comets tattooed on your persona? <laughs> oh, no, no. Oh, okay. No, no, no that's that the other it. Michael who was with Issa, with, uh, with the image. Oh, my Lord. That's, that's must be another Michael. Yeah, there is, actually an, there is no. another Michael. He's he's part of the team that was running Rosetta. <laughs> and oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I've seen, yeah, I've seen him on the... Uh, yeah, and he got into the, trouble for his yep. choice of uh, Hawaiian shirts. <laughs> uh, yeah, 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 that one, yeah. That was, yeah. <laughs> That's See, right. it's all comet related. <laughs> I think I'm going to get a tattoo of a coronavirus on my belly button. <laughs> I think that's what I'm going to do. Oh, Neil. Mm. Only you would do that. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Once we're out of lockdown, we ever get out of lockdown if everybody stays in, but um, that's getting political, and we're talking about comets. <laughs> well, the greatest, thing about, the greatest thing about lockdown is there's no contrails to get in your way. No aircraft to interfere. Oh, we're still overnight. getting loads. I yeah, we've got I loads. I haven't of... seen a plane in ages over my house. I have. They're, we've had loads still. I don't know where they're going. The fr I think they're mostly freight because I'm a bit addicted to flight radar apps. So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sad. <laughs> I've been ill, I've had nothing to do other than feel sorry for myself, so I've been watching plane finding apps for six weeks. <laughs> the mostly freight plane. I'm going to report them to the police or whatever authority does this sort of thing. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I it, it looks as if they're more than two metres apart, they're safe. Well, if you um, lockdown's great for learning a new skill, so just order a tattoo gun off eBay and just go on YouTube, and you'll be an expert by the end of it. There you go, Michael. The swan comet done in your belly button. Yeah. You, the, you know, your belly button is the coma, and you have the long iron tail going right up your breastbone. <laughs> maybe, yeah, uh, maybe. Uh, a Mural of uh, Soho on you, <laughs> on your back yeah. or something. <laughs> got to, got to complete, yeah. complete with solar panels, everything. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, really, I think so. Yeah, Soho is my favourite favourite telescope. Yeah. Space oh, I've, I've, I've been in, I've had a bit of luck as well with the with this lockdown. Yeah. Like um, in the morning sky, there's usually a uh, usually the the trots. 
they they uh, they have their bright lights on, so so my yeah. my sky is usually ruined by all the uh, flood lighting. But um, they've they've been forced to uh, shut down for the for the period. Mm-hmm. So I've had incredibly dark skies in the morning. Oh, so wow. so, I, um, so I can follow follow my comet, which is really nice. Our village school um, leave their outside lights on every single night until after 10 p.m., uh, even during holiday, and they're still on even now. The school's closed. It's so annoying. Yeah. They're really bright, unshielded white <coughs> lights. They're just awful. Mm. That's the thing. I know you want to talk about comment. Was it Enki as well? Oh, I was just going to say quickly, 58p, I was just looking at the oh, finder sorry. chart, it's going to pass super close to Mercury in the second week of May, so that would be interesting. That'd be good. So, nice. yeah. Yeah. We've, both, good. we've done Y4, we've done 2020 yeah. F8, I know yeah. that uh, 58p was on the list, uh, 2019 U6, I think we've covered that as well, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. 10, uh, 2000, oh, sorry, 210p Christian Sen. Yeah, I've got a story about that one. There we go. See, I've got a good, yeah, I've got yeah, a good yeah. story about that one. Yeah, back in uh, April 2003, I was hunting swan data, and I detected an object, and uh, notified uh, the authorities, and uh, nothing, nothing eventuated. And then uh, about a month later, Christensen discovers a comet. And if you if you traced it back to to the April, it it matched exactly the Swan Swan data. So this should have actually been called Two Ten P Swan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and, and on the show tonight. Or or no Swan Dash Christensen. I'm really not sure. <laughs> well, what, what's the uh, what Pro- what's problem the was the, the of Two Ten P? Yeah, Two Ten P. Yeah. yeah. And if you have a look at my website, I've actually. Uh, my Southern Comets homepage website. I've actually uh, showed the mark of where it is in in that in the um, in the data. So, Ooh. but the thing was, it was no one was able to confirm it, uh, particularly myself, because it was too way too low on the horizon. And the thing is, it's it's doing exactly what it did in two thousand and three, like the same perihelion time. Yeah. So it's identical to the two thousand and three apparition. Um, so it's extremely low for us, like a, a, a virtually invisible for us, but um, but at a reasonable height for for the northerners, but maybe about ten degrees elevation. So had had um, if that wouldn't have occurred, if this if it were this time around, somebody would have spotted it, no no doubt. Mm. So yeah, that's that's a nice nice history on that one. Well, yeah. it, it begs the question: somebody um, was <coughs> um, fast asleep if they missed that comet. In, in all the information, all the data there, <clears throat> um, because normally the, it will be shared. The name will be shared, uh, like uh, Iris Alcock. And I can't remember mm. the Alcock, yeah. yeah. Iris Racky Alcock, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So, so, so actually, so, I, tell you, I was going to say, Michael, just for the listeners at home, um, because yeah. everybody, you know, I mean, you've dis- you saw this the F eight comet. Could you explain to them why your name is not attached? Not on it. Yeah, of course, of course. Because I cheated. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I cheat. I don't use my own equipment. I use a satellite in space. So it's the so that it's it's uh, the the detector that gets yep. the uh, credit for it. Uh, like you know, I, I spend I spend twenty minutes on a computer screen every day looking looking as opposed to um, thousands and thousands of hours of searching. Searching the sky using my own equipment. I mean, losing, who would losing be silly enough to do that? Who'd be silly enough to do that? <laughs> <laughs> we we had this discussion about a week ago, didn't we, Michael? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Iras Iraqi Orcock. <clears throat> That's the one. That's right. I remember that uh, Terry. one. Terry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That I was going to say Terry. Yeah, yeah. Go, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I, come on, Iris Araki, I'll cop. Um, I actually I did a um, presentation not that long ago, and um, I was talking, uh, discussing my like, 10 best comets, and that was the one that came up be, in the number 10 because of um, 
very close approach to Earth, but mm. not, just the, not just the close approach to the Earth, but the fact that it, it was coming in um, at, a, at a very high inclination, so there was a high relative velocity for the Earth, so the motion across the sky was um, uh, really, really quick. Um, real time. Mm. Yeah. It was a real time. You could actually, in the telescope, you could actually watch the thing drifting across the star field in real time. Wow. So that was that was a really cool... Uh, <clears throat> not, not too impressive with the naked eye, but it was just... Um, the fact that it was so close and the fact it was moving so fast that really was stand out uh, for me. I've yeah, never well, seen many I, pictures of that one. Never seen many pictures. Because it was moving too fast. <laughs> yeah. Like, catch it. Yeah. Well, the thing it is... It was actually so... very similar, because uh, when I was doing the presentation, and I just pulled a, an image to 252p and stuck that up uh, there. And cheated. Yeah. With that... <laughs> I, I did actually disclose, but it, it looks oh. similar to Comet. Yeah. So just fuzz small. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it had a, a fairly bright uh, for condensation, so there was a fairly good frame of reference to watch it moving across the sky. Hmm. Well, the thing is, um, it made the closest known approach of any comet for 200 years. It was about 0 0.0312 AU. Um it's got an <clears throat> orbital period of so, uh, 970 years. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it was one of those things. Um, we had I, the IRAS survey going on in space. Um, and people forget, George Orcott was a visual observer. He ne he wasn't yeah. an imager. And he used a pair of binoculars, a huge pair of binoculars, um, for most of his for stuff. Through his window, yeah, which is yeah, one of the biggest window. no nos yeah. going. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. I think he found his first comet in about 1959 or something like that. I'm sure he found one in the, in the 50s, late 50s, the first one. And I think he, he sort of like he photographically, couple, yeah, he photographically memorized the Milky Way just so he can pick these things out. I think he used to do a lot of Nova work, didn't he? Nova, yeah. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, he discovered uh, two back in 68. Um, L mm. V Volpecula and V yeah. three six eight I think in Sagittarius or Scrotum in the seventies. He found his fifth and final comet in eighty three, which was yeah. C nineteen eighty three H one Iras Araki Orcock. Um yeah. this this guy was uh prolific. He was, but, and and he 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 really did make it clear that if you know <coughs> your sky, then you know what's out of place. Um, whether it's a yeah. comet or it's a novi, um, unless you know um, the star patterns, then you're going to miss a lot of stuff. <coughs> yeah, I do, do have an interesting story there because another guy similar, Rob McNaught. Uh, yeah. After the survey finished, he he was doing his own um, thing. I think visually, he noticed. Uh, he thought he'd found a nova in 2014. Mm. It said it had a, a blue colour. <laughs> so it was the fifth magnitude right. nova up <clears throat> near Orion, and then he realised it was uh, 2014 Q4. <laughs> but having fell, yeah, he know, he something. <laughs> <laughs> he noticed something out of place. But I believe um, George, uh, somebody I remember reading, he had memorised the positions of thirty thousand stars, or yeah, some definitely. phenomenal um, muscle memory there. You know, with. Uh, insane. It's incredible. Well, his, yeah. te his technique was to memorise the patterns of thousands of stars so that he yeah. would automatically spot any intruder. Yeah. He, made, he had a smudge on his window. He'd have misidentified comets left, right, and centre. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'd, I'd uh, like to see him memorise the Gaia DR2 catalogue. <laughs> 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 Billions of stars. 
I would not put that past. <laughs> I would not put that past him. He was a prodigy. We we'll try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have to ask if our um, if Terry or or Michael actually hunt. Although Terry's already got one, a Croix Group comet because that's uh, they're obviously very big. I mean, I mean, I know the Southern Hemisphere don't get very many good comets. It's uh, you know, <clears throat> so yeah, um, great ones. <laughs> you, yeah, you get great ones, not the good ones. Uh, and I just wondered if you if, if you hunt. So, well, Actually, yeah, I do. I do. You still look for them? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, I always keep yeah, I, I keep I keep points track on, uh, on 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 the, on the agenda for sure. Yes. But not not, not in the morning sky. Mainly during the the best time is around December, when, yeah. when the track is basically at the South Pole area. Right, and that's where that's where very few um, surveys get 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 to. Yeah, so, I think so, Terry yeah. got Terry, you got yours in Centaurus, didn't you? Uh, was it was it there you found it? Yeah, it was it Centaurus? I think. Yeah, uh, Centaurus. Uh, yeah, and that was about November, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah November. Oh, yeah. That was quite bright at the time, wasn't it? Was it quite bright at the time? Yeah. Well, well interesting. There was another one about six months later that it didn't survive, but yeah. it was actually brighter. Um, yeah. For perihelion. Um. <clears throat> that was twenty twelve E two. E. Yeah. E two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something like that, that actually showed up in Swan data, I believe, too. That's right. It was called Swan. Yep. Ah. So. You know that there's wasn't always, one of mine. Wasn't one of my finds. Oh right. But there's always oh, no. a prospect of finding uh, one of these brighter ones, or, or you know, like a, a a larger, small fragment, if you like. Um, yeah. On the way in, and you know, just hope that it survives. But I mean, yeah, I, I mean, never do any comet hunting at all at the moment. I, I've uh, basically like, finished up. With uh, my last find, I haven't done anything serious since then. Mm. Um, you know, part of the issue is light pollution here, but it's also the amount of time. You know, I've changed yeah. priorities. I'm actually observing a bit more than I than I, uh, I was. So, um, doing a comet survey is a pretty time intensive <laughs> activity. So. <laughs> I'm kind of enjoying more of observing than than actually um, discovering for a change. It's relaxing, yeah. isn't it? It's just nice to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm more than happy to let other people do that <laughs> job. <laughs> so, um, that's, that's why I, that's why I use a computer screen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's probably not that much um, easier though finding stuff on Swan because I, I know Michael has shown me some of his finds and I, th- I thought boy you're digging into the noise there. <laughs> <laughs> well um, looking if you if you look how Masanora Yuchina works or um, yes. Tyra gave um, <clears throat> they're literally going through um, image by image <clears throat> and re- they yeah. must be replaying the movies um, from Soho, etc., multiple times just to catch the comments. I know. So if, sometimes you can't even see them. It's crazy how they can see them. Yeah. Well, I think you there's a bit of training. Oh, it pretty, yeah. It's quite clear to me when Michael was showing me his. Um, <clears throat> they could while back. This obviously, you know, you're training your. After you've seen a couple brighter ones. Yeah. You, possibly training your um, uh, mind to actually see the, the objects and the noise because some of them are, are really on the cusp on the of being line. detected. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. That, that's why I think you need about five positions or so. Like, I, I don't know, will you, Michael, when yeah, you, yeah. At, at what point do you... Yeah, about that. You say, oh, I think I've definitely got something here. That's right. Yeah, you know, it was about five positions I had before I was reasonably confident. Whereas, if I was looking at, um, I, I would take three images in the sky. So you, you, if you're digging that deep into the noise, you're going to get a lot of false positives. So you have to um, uh, um, yeah. look for fairly obvious objects. Um, but 
yeah, in the, if you're digging in the noise, you just need more more points, basically, more images to be sure. Mm. So did you use to compare those manually, like visually, or did you have software that was detecting stuff? I, I ended up having some software I had um, written to actually help. I mm. still did. I still did uh, check the objects that were coming out, but, you know, by eye. So I'm not trusting the computer because I get a lot of false positives. Uh, yeah. So I probably end up with about a couple of hundred false positives in the morning and then I'd search through and I'd probably find out of those one or two um, actual candidates, which yeah. I'd follow up on. And Generally, they'd be an existing object or just something that... that that filled the computer and myself. Mm. Um, but I did find, so 2011 W3 actually found looking at the images manually. So at that point I hadn't developed um, software to help me. At that point I was looking at the images manually and looping through them. Um, and that so, was yeah, fantastic that was... at that time, by the way. Like, when Terry sent me those his positions, I had I had my guide software loaded up with a with a Kreutz Sungrazer and a Perihelion date of December the fifteenth, and it matched it exactly. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it matched it because because that's what I do. I simulate I simulate them in guide, so I know where they're at. <laughs> ah, and, uh, these he, he sent me the positions, and I plugged them into guide. And I just jumped off my chair. <laughs> Couldn't believe that, uh, well, you that know, this thing I, was moving in the same direction as a Kreutz Sungrazer. I almost rejected that one as a as a reflection from I think it was Gamma Centauri, and I, I did oh, initially, yeah. and, it, and it just played in my mind, mm. and I thought oh, I should just double check this. Yeah. And I went back, I had a look at it, and it said, <clears> no, it's not really consistent with a reflection, and then. Yeah. So unfortunately, I'll, I'll let a day miss with that because I was unsure. I could have got it the next morning and verified it, but I, I kind of sat on it a bit, and then the following morning I went in, and to my um, shock, <laughs> there was an object in the right position, and I thought, "Oh, okay, I think I might have wow. something here," and that's when I started pestering Michael and a few of the others mm -hmm. to go after it. So, and, and no, and no one gave it any. No one gave yeah. it any hope either. No, I, no. I definitely. Yes, <laughs> so when it survived, it popped out of the other end. Uh, it was just a. It was a. It was a eureka moment, wasn't it? Yeah, so well, I. I it uh, survived. I, I'm still kind of. I don't know if I was in the right frame to even enjoy it. You know, like it was just one of those things, and um, <clears> uh, I was actually really happy to actually see it before perihelion visually so you know having yeah. got up put the telescope very few, on pe very few people to observe it visually uh, a sun grazer pre-perihelion yeah or yeah, even to see a, a Troitz comet actually with your own eyes and i thought okay yeah. well that's that's I'd, I'd actually accomplished that and that was only about magnitude 11 or so at the time but you know you could see it fairly <coughs> easily um in the telescope and i thought Nobody. well that would that, that'd be the end of it I'll, we'll never i've seen it yeah. that's it, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that'll be the end of it no, it'll be gone in a few days time um so yeah yeah nobody's seen one since about 1970 had they was it about 1970 since one that's right yeah that was the last the last time yeah what what or tease by lily yeah was it. graham that's white right. um <clears throat> he found one in 10 by 50 binoculars, I believe. Wow. Deep in twilight. Yeah. And uh, I think it was, was a... He was a pilot. He was a pilot. pilot yeah, I think. Pilot, yeah. yeah. Um, I think there was also... There was quite a few independent discoveries. There were, I think it was an airline hostess in one of the, one of the discoverers. But obviously didn't get the obviously didn't get in fast enough to report it. <laughs> so, out of so. both of you guys, which which comet most impressed you? The, of all the ones that you found, 
which ones can you say, you know, stick a name on, say, I'm really proud of this one for what it achieved or the show it put on or how you discovered it or, you know, which oh, one? the ones that I've found. Yeah. Of the, which oh, oh, the 2011 best? W3. Oh, no, definitely. Without a doubt. That had 30 degree, 30 degree naked eye tail. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, none of the others um, come close to the other the other five. It was bright, it was bright from, from tip to toe. <clears throat> I mean, I saw yeah. two of yours. I saw the... I didn't see that one. Um, I saw the, obviously, but I saw the, um, uh, was it was it R, 2013 R1? R1 and uh, Q4. Yeah, Q4. They're the two that I saw of yours. And I remember seeing R1 um, in, in near the Beehive Cluster, and it was green. I've never, ever visually seen a green comet until then. Because it's really close to Earth in that November time. Uh, that impressed me a lot, but the Q4 was unbelievable. I mean, I remember seeing that through the telescope and it had a tail, and it was so dynamic. It was changing. Um, every night it was changing. I just literally had the telescope on it for hours. Everything else went out the window, and I just watched that particular comet. What about you, Michael? Which one was would, would be your... I mean, obviously, we don't know how the Swan one's going to perform at the moment, the F8, but it could be the, <laughs> could be the, the good one. one. I, was, I think, could but, be the uh, best yeah, one. for me... For me, the best one one was the was the first one, two thousand four H six. When I, uh, I basically raced out as soon as I saw it on the data, I raced out into the uh, evening sky with a pair of twenty five by hundred binos and spotted it about oh. seventh magnitude. And it's like, wow, this is uh, this is mine. You know, it's the first pair of eyes to to set 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 onto this comet. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and good on him for reporting it as a swan discovery too. And um, yeah, that's right. I'm not cheating. <laughs> <laughs> not cheating. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the thing that the beauty was, it was actually heading into conjunction. So so I had to wait another week, and oh, then God. try and rediscover it in the morning sky. Yeah, of course. So I had to had to refind it. Had to chase it again to see, to see where it went. <laughs> so that, that was it. it. Took took quite a lot of effort to. Uh, to get that, uh, get that final, get, nail it finally. <laughs> yeah, and I was quite impressed with that. And it had a nice tail on it too. So a, got about seventh mag with a little tail, iron tail on it. I think wow. I might have had a go at trying to confirm that as well. It was, uh, I remember, it was was tough trying to get it. I, I think I tried it in the morning sky, probably a bit early, but yeah, <clears throat> it was a tough one to find that that point but i think the the brightest one that that was seen was uh, uh was it m4 2006 m4 that's that right got about, got about fourth magnitude i think <clears throat> it was a big big outburst back in uh was it year 2006 but not, yeah. not visible for us. it was more of a northern northern object yeah. um i think i actually had uh pre-discovery images of that too um or it might might have been uh during that period so i think um i either you'd messaged me or i'd, I'd heard about it and uh, i thought oh i actually covered that area and i went and had a look in the images and yeah sure enough mm. uh, um the thing is i couldn't identify any motion it was kind of stuck in between a couple of stars, so I discounted it as a galaxy at the time. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> it's actually so another you... one as well. Uh, there was a there was two thousand and five T four, uh, which which is actually a short period. It's got something like a twenty year period. Um, so that's that's going to be coming coming <clears throat> around again in twenty thirty or some somewhere around that mark. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you say your greatest? comments were because obviously in the north up here i mean people of a certain age will remember say west in 76 or bennett in 70 and uh, sort of people of my age i mean i mean i remember seeing high katakes in the sky the huge tail going across the sky and of course we had uh hail bop for so long it was an amazing object but down south of course you have um you've had i mean i suppose yeah north, McNaughton, McNaughton lovejoy yeah yeah, they've got to be your greatest ones uh, in De your d visual history. Yeah. Yep. I, I, I'm actually l lucky in that I actually um, flew to the Northern Hemisphere, <laughs> specifically to see Common Hail Bop. And oh, you I saw got up some here? Really good, yeah. yeah, so I actually got, 
I've seen, I've had good views of all of those comets in in perfect conditions, which I'm mm. really pleased to have had. Um, but you know, the, it's, when people ask you what's the best, it's kind of hard to um, yeah hard to say because they're, they're kind of very different looking objects. So um, Akataki me, was yeah. For me, Hikitaki was the one because, I mean, I remember looking up at the sky and it just reminded me of all the pictures that I'd ever seen of comets in, in, in you know, the, the old-fashioned comets, the ones with the huge, you know, like, semitic, like, tails stretching across. You know, I mean, it had to be at least 80 degrees now I think back on it. It was unbelievable. Yakitaki yeah, was probably um, was such a, a different comet too, but it was um, huge. So we, we got... Even two days after it had disappeared, the coma had disappeared, we could actually see the tail still poking up from yeah. on, the, on the horizon. Um, yeah. McDonald was brighter. Uh, yeah. much more, uh, there's a spectacular tail on McNaught as well. Unbelievable uh, tail on McNaught. Mm-hmm. So, it was uh, like a 30 degree arc of, uh, yeah. of wonder. <clears throat> so, if I had to pick between, I'd, I'd definitely. You know, in terms of spectacle, probably uh, not. Would would yeah. get that, uh, the Commodore Century hail, yep. yeah, hail Bob. So I, I got off my, my memory of um, I got off the plane. I think it was in late March, and my first impression because uh, I, I hadn't seen the comet for many months, so it had actually, I think the last time I'd seen it was about fourth magnitude or so, and it brightened up to negative magnitude. Yeah. And I remember thinking, wow, the, the coma is bright. And I just look at, look at the coma, and the first uh, probably degree or two of tail, yeah. that impressed me, but then... Where's the rest of the comet? Was my, I know. my next impression was uh, it 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 the brightness of the tail didn't extend very far. No, um, you could see probably at the time maybe fifteen or sixteen degrees of tail, but you had to kind of use inverted vision and you could see the the iron tail. Yeah, it was definitely there, and it did get brighter yeah. into April. Um, yeah. The brightness seemed to improve in the tail but it was not in the same league as Yakutaki or no. um, McDonald in terms of like a impressive visual comet um, with a naked eye but boy when you got onto the comet in a telescope or binoculars oh, it was yeah. it was something else I saw hoods yeah yeah in a, my, the view yes. of the tenant yeah, in terms of telescopic or a binocular comet, I think that actually is near the top of the list. Uh, I mean, Yakitaki was pretty good too because of the amount of detail on the tail. Um, you know, so you've got those three comets and then you've got um, the one that I've found a lot further down on the list for me in terms of a spectacle, but you could still see the... My memory still are. Oh, you can still still see the tail sticking up from behind the horizon. Mm. So it was still a pretty good comet. But yeah, for me it would be um, if you wanted to rank, it'd be McNaught, Yakutaki, Hal yeah. Bob, and W three. Didn't you? Did, were you the last? I think you're credited, Terry, as the last person to to well certainly document or mention that Hal Bob was still naked eye. Is that is that right? I'm one of the first people to see it. Uh, I, I, maybe I, I think others saw it a bit after I did because I, I got to see it in perfect conditions um, before perihelion. Yeah. Um, in a, I think it was about the same time Yakutaki was around. Yeah. And I remember it was up up towards Jupiter. Actually, Jupiter was in the sky, and I was actually having to shield Jupiter. Um. Mm. And yeah, I was sure I could make it out um, even in uh, May. And so when you take that date, and last time was seen with the naked eyes, about eighteen months. Yeah. So it, 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 
look like he'd never leave. <laughs> it was almost a permanent <laughs> mixture. <laughs> Uh, at this point, I'm going to make a, a slight comment. If we keep going for another 35 minutes, we will actually set a record. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get <laughs> seriously. Um, <laughs> we've been going for about an hour and a half now um, of the actual show. Not I mean. Um, so yeah, I, I, I get the feeling we're probably going to be going for another. We definitely can go through the two-hour m- uh, limit. Well, there is no limit really because uh, these days it goes straight to YouTube. Um, yeah. So obviously, people who want to listen uh, listen to the show, or technically watch the show, um, don't have to worry about it. And uh, uh, we've I'll, got a celebrity, I'll... haven't we? Absolutely, <laughs> two celebrities actually. Um, but yeah, as I say, um, no, no, no. <laughs> it's really a case of what AFM says no longer applies to us. So, yeah. <laughs> so let's, let's keep going, chat, shall we? <laughs> Just until we pass oh. out, because in England it's what time? <laughs> past twelve at night. <laughs> well, so, if you're fine. Was... I'll probably pass out for twenty minutes, and then I'll wake up again and we'll keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it's pretty summertime. Everybody knowing the joke. If I get my breakfast, I'll pass out too. <laughs> yeah, we don't talk about what Michael's having for breakfast. Uh, we run out of stuff. <laughs> Five minutes. Uh, um, uh, comments. All right. I had, uh, it was interesting because I had a list of top 10 comments. I actually did a presentation only, I think, about two weeks ago. Oh. And uh, interesting, I should um, read them out and see if anyone actually agrees. Yeah, with them. Yeah. And yeah. So I've just got to dig up. Um, I've <laughs> actually forgotten them now. <laughs> <Fine enough. laughs> so the presentation was Terry's top 10. So I had in my list, and I, I did it in a chronological type of order. Okay. But you'll, you'll see what I, I mean. So my first pick was um, was Comet um, Iris Araki Alcock. Mm-hmm. Um, Definitely. And, mm-hmm. uh, and the category, it was impressive because it was an earth-grazing comet. Um, and the thing that point that I made was that um, if a comet is point one of an astronomical unit from the Earth, it's going to be a hundred appear a hundred times brighter or five times mag- or five magnitudes brighter than if it was one astronomical unit from the Earth. So when you get a comet like Iris Araki Alcock that passes point oh three of a astronomical unit, well if you did the sums I think that's about eight magnitudes uh, brightening and um, it was just not that it was also the fact that it was um, a moving so fast across the sky that impressed me so that that was number one mm-hmm. and then I had to throw in Haley in there yeah. Yeah. Six, so as a famous periodic comet um, uh, during the talk I explained why I didn't think it was a flop and I also showed photos showing how the um, during April the tail uh, fanned right out, so we're looking almost straight down the tail. But in April it, it closed up again. In late April it cl- started closing up again. Yeah. Um, so the third one was Shoemaker Levy, which was yes. just a, mm-hmm. which I described as the best comment on them. Number number nine, yeah. <laughs> no. uh, even though I never actually even saw the comet, definitely saw the aftermath, and that was mm. really something. And even the backstory of that is really fascinating. Um, with that, with David Levy saying that he, um, um, they had some old photographic plates that they used that they were, were partly damaged, but they still used them anyway and did a run. And so, thankfully, he did that and. You know, the Shoemakers and Levy's got that comet. Uh, yeah. It was a yeah. once-in-a-thousand event, wasn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, not only uh, that, it, it actually um, helped explain some of the most some unusual crater, uh, crater chains that were being seen on, on the, in the Galilean <laughs> moons. Um, yeah, we, We'd absolutely. seen them, but we couldn't figure out at that point what could have caused them. And... Shoemaker Levy 9 
was kind of this is um, nature saying wake up guys it's this is what's happening um, but yeah um, I remember I remember all the, all the fun and games and how people were basically <coughs> were shocked yeah we did a show too didn't we absolutely it was um <coughs> It was one of those uh, amazing events, you know, that, that may not repeat for, you know, another couple of hundred years. You know, it's one of those things we're lucky to be alive kind of mm-hmm. events. Definitely. Um, even, even that Mars event, you know, that sighting spring in uh, 2014 when, when it uh, approached Mars to like 100,000 kilometres. Yep. Yeah, that's that's an unbelievably near miss. That's 0.00088 astronomical units. That's how close yeah. it got to Mars. <laughs> Imagine you, you know that, something like that happening happening to yeah, Earth. On Earth. Yeah, oh, absolutely. They had, they, they had an extremely intense meteor storm on Mars. Yeah, at that point, yep. at the flyby. And of course, so it was really, seen. I didn't, didn't realise that. I have to. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It was seen from the surface as well, wasn't it? It was the first time we've seen a comet in the sky of another planet. Yeah. Yeah. The cur- I think it was Curiosity or one, one of those. Uh, Took a shot, yeah. Took an image, yep. Yeah. yeah, not not designed to do long exposure photography, but it, it <laughs> did get an image. So <laughs> you got something, yeah. Got something there, yeah. Um, so my so the next comment I picked Yakutaki because of the long tail. Yeah. So it was number four, and then we moved on to Hail Bob, being a a. One thing I said about Hale Bop, uh, which um, I'll read you out, actually the, the words here. I said, comets are often compared using intrinsic brightness. So the standard yardstick is what magnitude would the comet be if it was exactly one astronomical unit from both the Earth and the Sun. This is called the absolute magnitude. Um, now most comets come in around magnitude 7 to 11 on the absolute magnitude scale with bright comets coming in around about magnitude 6 Mm. Um, great comets are typically in the range of magnitude 3 to 6 on the absolute magnitude scale and then maybe two times per century we will see a comet with an absolute magnitude of 1 or so enter the inner solar system and examples of these comets you can literally count on a hand um, so previous examples were 1914, 1882, 1825, 1811 and 1744, so about twice a century. Yeah. Uh, Comet Hale Bob clocked in at an amazing absolute minus magnitude. Two, minus one. It? I think it was minus one. Uh, mm. This has no precedent uh, since scientific records of comets have been kept. Um, so I said in terms of like a giant... Um, comment in terms of brightness that's a standout I'm sure the parent sun grazer in 300 BC or something would have would have been gigantic as well yeah, yeah. well we don't, if you go to a thousand years maybe it's a different story but you know definitely you know in recent centuries there's been oh, yeah, yeah, no yeah. I mean still I think the 1744 comet um, probably has the, the the best combination of uh High intrinsic brightness and small perihelion. Was that the Messier uh, comet? Was that was that the Messier comet or no? Uh, was, no, no, was, no, I don't think it, it was really um, named. <laughs> named. Yeah, uh, it was unofficially known. It's just called the Great Comet. Yeah, uh, the eighteen eighty two comet was a Kreutz comet. Um, yeah, yeah, and its brightness was probably attributed to splitting apart. So. Uh, but there which, you go. Which, which one was W um, your W three related to? Was it related to the eighteen eighty two one or was uh, yeah? So eighteen eighty two. I, I have thought, my doubts yeah. how it was calculated the brightness too on that the intrinsic brightness. Mm. So I don't really put it up with those big comets, but no. Um, so after um, how Bob. Um, one I put down, which I thought was quite remarkable, was the was Soho 
1998 J1 because it was the first time we'd actually it was one of those comets that just appeared out of the blue yeah um, so it when it was first found it was magnitude zero <laughs> so yeah, in, in the in the soho data yeah mm. the soho wow. data so we basically went from not having a knowing about the comet to having this bright comet basically on our yeah. doorstep yeah it was probably yeah. missed it was probably missed discovering in the southern hemisphere prior to prior to perihelion mm. yeah so for that had been a survey and i think that was one of the things that got me thinking too about doing a survey in the southern hemisphere um then there was the 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 next comet which is an outbursting comet and i had two candidates for this uh but i ended up because i'm in the southern hemisphere i ended up giving it to a comet called 2000 wm1 linear yeah definitely my favorite because that that uh I, I actually caught it in outburst with the pair of binos and, it, and you can see a couple of horns just jutting out of the nucleus it looked like a yeah, you know, something you something you see in the drawings of of past great comets. It was absolutely phenomenal. Wow! So check and check my website out, and you, you can see some of the photos that I've managed to capture with it. That the fountain so, the fountains just pouring off the nucleus were were, were visible and and just phenomenal. <coughs> I haven't I haven't actually seen so much nuclear detail in a comet before. Yeah, um, I, I had that in a six inch telescope, and I was just my my jaw was just yeah, it was jaw dropping. Uh, the amount of jet up to, up to about second magnitude went from mm. magnitude six to two and a half six, i think two, in yep. 48 hours yeah wow <laughs> 20, 24 so when, hours actually <laughs> yeah it might wow. have been 24 hours and of course we had common homes now oh, common yes. homes was amazing but for us here in the southern hemisphere we didn't get a terribly good view it was over on the northern horizon um, oh yeah remember it well of course so yeah, I I picked probably 2000 WM1 because there's probably more <laughs> visible detail, you mm. know, spewing out of the coma, um, and then you know I had um, one of the the other next memorable comet was 73P, which is a fragmenting comet, yeah. and um, that was kind of really cool because it it. It also outbursts, so I saw it in 95 when it went from magnitude 12, 14 to magnitude 12 to 5. 5. <laughs> cool. yeah. And it, it did that. And, um, and it was an extended outburst. Yeah. And yeah. then it returned its multiple comets, which was <clears> amazing. <throat> just the two, two yeah, binoculars. 2006, yeah. A double comet show in 2006. And, and then, of course, uh, the next big comet was the daylight com uh the you know the comet mcnaught yeah. which really stands out to me because of the, the how easy it was to see in daylight um you know, i got one really nice view in the daytime even though it was a bit hazy and um i was scanning around with 15 by 70 binoculars with the sun hidden behind the roof and it just all of a sudden, boom, that was um, tail and all. Saying about so, Comet Holmes, um, Terry, cool. um, in, yes. our, in our little chat room, our private chat room, I've just popped a link in for you, um, because I was actually going back through some old pictures, and I found one from 2007, when I actually started astroimaging properly, um, um, November the 18th, <laughs> Comet Holmes. It's a mm. cracker. Because um, I, I, I had to Google the date just to make sure what it was. Because I could, I didn't, I, th I thought it was Holmes, but when I put the dates in, the date span, yeah. the only bright, really bright comet um, <clears> was <throat> Holmes. So I found that picture. It's up on my, on I my remember, account. Yeah, I remember going outside um, around that time and a beautiful, clear pitch black night and all of a sudden there's this little cloud in the sky and uh i thought no it can't be <laughs> i thought it's got to be a comet i haven't discovered it obviously but uh, <laughs> i could not believe just how clear it was with your eyes it was unbelievable 
I just um, I posted a pitch of <coughs> WM1 linear just in the private chat there. Oh yeah. my word! <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. So, um, yeah, well, I actually had um, I had the telescope. So when I took that photo, not long before that, uh, I was set up at my old house. I was at the front. And um, two, I think, slightly inebriated girls were walking down the street, <laughs> obviously at a, coming back from a party. <laughs> and they said, "What?" And they're kind of in disbelief. What? What on earth are you doing um, <laughs> out the front <laughs> with this? It was a Takahashi telescope, so it had that yellow colour, and yeah. um, they were kind <laughs> of. And um, I remember, you know, showing them, and they were really fascinated. But I'm pretty sure they were pretty drunk, you know. At the time. <laughs> you know, who walks down the street at 3 a.m. in the morning? You know, when <laughs> um, <laughs> usually astronomers or uh, oh yeah, have a look at that photo. Oh yeah, yeah that, that was... Wow, just popped another just one. Just a new new well, detail. Yeah, I got the same day. Um, again, it's Comet Holmes back in 2007, uh, and that, that to me was, that was, I was like looking at this off the scope feed, and it was like, wow. <laughs> Looks like a Pac-Man ghost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> insane, wasn't it? Absolutely insane. Yeah. So these all look like those yeah. um, Chinese silk paintings, you know, the, the really old ones that where they used to record the comets yeah. and with the different natural disasters and trying to link the shapes with different events. And th those paintings are just so awesome. And all of these pictures you're sharing just remind me of those. A pity none of the listeners can see. <laughs> all right. Yeah, we'll put yeah, them on well. there. We'll put I've got those. Trust, trust me, they, they're good. Yeah. I can put if I can get I've got links for my two pictures. If I can get links for the uh pictures from you guys as well, then I can, I can put them into the show notes. Yeah. You I've can got, also got, put them up on screen as well during the video. Yep, I can do that as well. You can paste maybe paste them. I, I don't mind if you just re paste them. Sure, I can I can actually put I can put these into the actual video of the show. As well. So I did, there's one of Holmes I took. That was just with a tripod um, mounted camera with the clouds and the moon, moonlit night. Oh, it's pretty. So, <laughs> I actually thought it was a star with a naked eye. I thought, oh, that can't be it. And then I looked in binoculars and um, it was Comet Holmes. Mm. <laughs> At that, that point, it, it, it hadn't expanded very much. Um, so, yeah, so that was... Uh, and, and, of course, I put my own comment in there for the, the, the last of the top ten. Mm, cool. Because why not? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> it was pretty memorable for me anyway. I think so, we've all seen that picture as well, haven't we? Of your comment coming... I mean, I, I don't know who took it from space or what what probe or whatever it was i don't know who did it but we we've all seen that uh probably space shuttle wasn't it of uh, your comet sticking up above the earth's you know oh the international space station yeah space station yes yeah, such a beautiful comet coming above there because it was a headless comet too wasn't it because it it got a good kicking when it went around the sun well it did yeah uh but the tail was still pretty bright it just it was didn't end, yeah. ended a, a what you a normal head, you know, there was just nothing. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No. Um, actually, one of my favourite pictures was the SDO. I'm just posting mm. a photo there. Oh, I didn't. Try again. <laughs> <laughs> so what would your, what would oh, our, it. what would our sort of like, um, the comments that let us down the most uh, we had high hopes on or good hopes and they <laughs> i mean for example ison was mine i mean they i mean i didn't follow the build it up the greatest comment of the century i didn't believe that i never did believe that but i expected a bit of a show if you know what i mean it's something decent to look at um 
But of course, you think you know what I think. One of the problems are these, <clears> these days you've got people with such fancy equipment now. They they make a very small comet look spectacular. Yes, it definitely gives you that false impression. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've got I've got quite a few um, failed comets in my list. <laughs> yeah, Austin, Austin in 1990 was the big one for me. <laughs> well, I had a. My introduction to um, small comets don't survive, um, uh, you know, near the sun. I had a few of those in the 80s, so there were two, McNa uh, two Macaltz comets, yeah. 85 and 88, which were two comets that, that both were uh, didn't survive, nor did they become bright. Um, no. So, you know, at the time... Um, there are predictions, of, you know, that could be second, third, first magnitude, but neither of them got past about magnitude six or seven, yeah. and both were destroyed. So at that point, I was a bit wary <laughs> of a lot of the predictions of having bright comets near the sun. So, um, but then Austin came along and. Uh, yeah, with due respect to Rodney Austin. <laughs> well, Rodney, <laughs> yeah. Because it, it actually did um, um, seem to fade intrinsically. You know, it actually not only did it brighten slower than um, what you'd predict as just a normal reflecting object would, it actually got fainter. Uh, so instead of reaching first magnitude it was about magnitude five maybe four or five poor uh, rodney poor rodney <laughs> poor rodney and then david levy found a nice comet to make up for it not long after yeah right. yep. yeah yeah um actually you say david he, he I, said it's david <laughs> yeah i remember him telling off uh, jim scotty about that <laughs> yeah he did yeah that's it <laughs> I st I stayed with him for a couple of days, and yeah, he 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 might have corrected me a few times, uh, <laughs> but he didn't didn't make too much of a deal about it because um, um, I remember I hit my head on a nail in his observatory. Ow! Oh, was no. excruciating pain, you know, for like a half an hour or an hour or so with this nail. <laughs> That he left sort of sticking out, and he was so he felt so bad about it. But I, I do, I I do boss forgive him for that, and um, I didn't think anything of it. It was just an accident. <laughs> so maybe that's why he didn't correct me um, on it as much as he should have done. Actually, you're saying about um, comets that fizzled. Um, I think the one that sticks in my mind was Comet West. Um, because that was 1973, and I believe Skylab was still in orbit. Kahootek, uh, you know? Kahootek, Kahootek. Kahootek. the one in the morning in England. We're getting the years mixed up. <laughs> yeah, <that's possible. laughs> yeah. West but, uh, was 76. West was 76, okay. Well, I was three years yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Um, Not much then. Yeah, but uh, it was a long time ago. Um, yeah, absolutely. Considering the fact I'm... Much much older than I was then, um, but I remember yeah. Comet West. Everybody was had high high expectations and uh, didn't really happen. Um, no, you mean, mean you mean Kahootek, Not West was fantastic. Okay, He's yeah. Done that again. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> See, I do get things wrong occasionally, and I admit it. Of course. <laughs> Another reason Comet West split as well, didn't it? I think it split into four pieces at least. Split. It also had yeah. four scattering. Um, yeah effect on it but apparently yeah. um, um, it's worth reading um, I think it was one of the issues of Sky and Telescope where there's actually a a, um, a blow 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 account that shows you how excited <laughs> people were um, yeah. so there's an account of about a guy racing up um, to the top of Mount Pinos in uh, Los it's near a mountain near Los Angeles, north of mm. Los Angeles, where a lot of the astronomers go if you want to get away into a relatively dark sky. And it was just his account of um, racing up the 
the top of the mountain to get a view of Comet West and describing, you know, the flickering of the tail through the trees as he's driving, you know, looking out the side of his eye and he could see this fountain of light flickering through the grove of the trees. Yeah. And yeah. It was just that the description. And then um, later on, I remember reading somebody was um, in a phone booth and they called um, the Sky and Telescope office and we go, uh, um, could hardly contain their excitement. We're, we're relaying what they were seeing, you know, on a phone call, <laughs> you know, on a phone booth. Uh, okay. So, yeah, this was an exciting one. But Comet Kahootek, I think, was the one that you might be thinking of that got the big build-up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now, now I know what my confusion was um, because what, what it was, Skylab 4 um, observed uh, <clears throat> Kahootek's comet. Soyuz 13... Mm did as well um, so that was the first comet to be observed by a manned space station and of course there were there were a couple of other comets uh, C 1970 K1 uh, White Ortez Balili um, Kahutek of course and C 1975 V1 West along with 1980 E1 mm. Bowel so yeah, <clears throat> yeah okay that's why I was confused because I know Skylab was set to um, uh, observer comet and it, it was a bit of a bit of a disaster so yeah that's why I got confused because they did actually also go out go on and Im look at uh, Comet West as well so that's where my confusion was so uh, yeah, yeah. It. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it must be late in the night for you <laughs> yeah have, it is it, um, it, it is a, um, it's quarter to it one is. but it's summer time yes <laughs> yeah so, uh, we hit the two-hour mark. <laughs> we're, getting, we're definitely getting there, um, because I know that you, you wanted to speak about, uh, talk about Enki. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, Enki, yeah. That's a, that's a, um, that's old faithful. That has been a pain yes. in the posterior for me, because every time it's come round to perihelion, I've tried to image it, and it, it, something always seems to me mess with my imaging. Obviously, the last time I tried it, which was back in 2017, the moon, good old Luna, was interfering. Um, yeah. so, and that was around perihelion, and then was the 10th of March. The next one, obviously, is the 25th of June of this year. Um, <coughs> it's supposed to be... I'm seeing a, a more MOID of 0 0.17 AU, 25 million kilometres, they're talking about. Yeah, it's going to be a it's going to be a good southern apparition this yeah. year. So unfortunately, unfortunately for you guys, you'll miss out. But we'll yeah, we we'll get a perfect perfect uh, view in the evening sky on, in July. I'm not worried, the problem, Michael. Problem with Enki. I'll, I'll go into a remote scope in Chile. But, well, the problem <laughs> with Enki is that it just um, evaporates mm. so fast yes. after um, perihelion. So even if you get a close approach. There's, there's hardly anything to see anyway. Hardly Michael. anything to see, yeah. Very diffuse, yeah. <laughs> um, it, it rapidly goes from uh, being really condensed to just um, nothing. In fact, I've, I haven't had a lot of luck with it, except imaging-wise. Uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've, I know I've gone for it visually <clears throat> and not seen it, and then then seen somebody reported at eighth magnitude and <laughs> I must need <laughs> yeah. nice guys yeah. to see it. <laughs> well, back in December of twenty nineteen, the <clears throat> nucleus was measured at approximately two point nine eight miles, four point eight kilometers. Um, it completes an orbit every three point three years, so this is a comet that's that's really been around the block quite a bit. Um, the only It's quite large for a comet too. Yeah. The only, mm. other, the only other really short, shortest period comet is the faint maiden belt comet, uh, 311p pan stars, and that's only got a period of 3.2 years. So, yeah. It should be interesting. Um, there was a there was a comet Helfensleder, there, wasn't there? Way way back in long long ago, that had a sh even shorter period, or, or yeah, a I... period one that that's lost. Hasn't yeah. been found yet. Yeah, I don't think that's, <clears throat> that's right. Period would be too certain. No, no that's right. Yeah, that's, the, that's the issue with these. I don't think they. There's not a lot of certainty in those old orbits. Yeah. Uh, 
So I wouldn't tell you too much on that. I'm, I'm actually having a look at the prospects for Enki this year. Yeah. So. Well, the interest. Middle East. Of interest. I was going to say, just out of interest, they're talking about Enki. I mean, it was um, when was, I, I'm not near a computer, so uh, off the top of my head, it was discovered originally. Discovered, no, it was discovered about six or seven times, but originally about 1780 something. Or was it? Is that right? 1780. Was Pons? Uh, January. Was Pons the yeah. first guy that picked it up? Uh, no, I believe uh, so. I think it was Pierre McCain. I don't know how long it as well. Pierre McCain, Johann Franz Enki, cool? Carl Ludwig Christian Rumika. Those are the yeah. names I've got. But what, I was just wondering why do we think it was, I mean, obviously it's, it's such a short period. How come it was never seen before? And it's obviously brighter in the late 1700s. How come it was never seen before that? Because obviously if it's going around the sun in such a short period, uh, and as Terry says, it's, you know, it's, it's fizzing away there. It's fizzing away every 3.3 every years. How come it was never seen before 1780, um, whatever the year was? <laughs> Where, why did it just suddenly appear in, in that, in that oh, time? <clears throat> You'd have to, you have to <clears throat> ask the orbital experts. Because I just don't think the, I think the orbit, is, the orbit is pretty stable. Um, yeah. It, it's possible that you may Maybe find... Maybe it's fragmented. Maybe it's fragmented. <laughs> well... You might actually find uh, there are reports back earlier that just haven't been linked, you know, yeah. so... Probably um, Chinese astronomers. And, astronomers. and yeah. I think at that there, it's only certain apparitions that are... that are, uh, or certain returns that are actually favourable enough for it to reach naked eye visibility. Yeah. So they may occur once every 50 years so you may actually find and, and during a close approach it may only be bright for a few days anyway so yeah it's a, that is a question an interesting question we might find observations if we go back further um we may be able to link observations but the mm. the problem is, is you, it, uh the quality observations as you go back um Deteriorate, don't they? Deteriorate greatly. Yeah. Uh, and <coughs> so, unless you've you've got linking yeah. observations, it's going to be hard to, to tell. But that comet is certainly it. Um, it used to get to third or fourth magnitude, and you don't really yeah. see it past magnitude six anymore. I know. So that means, shall we say that in say a hundred years' time, it will be next to nothing <laughs> pretty much yeah well, actually <clears throat> comet similar to uh, sorry uh, to Anki is uh, 96p Macaults which is a really oh, interesting yeah. comet that's already started to fragment uh, but interesting it's perihelion distance is steadily decreasing yeah. uh so, you know, in about 100 years, I think its perihelion will be down to about a third of what it is now. So it's actually, um, don't quote me on that, but it is uh, decreasing. Yeah. And I think in around the 2028 20, time frame, I think it actually drops significantly, steps down significantly. So that one will be worth watching, you know, as a... Um, yeah. Because uh, we're mentioning Ank, and we're talking like short period comets. Um, uh, it kind of made me think of 96P. So we'll mm -hmm. definitely keep our eyes on that one yeah. over, the, over the time. Interestingly... Um, and of course, there's a lot of people... Okay, Sorry, gonna, carry on, Nick. What I was going to say was, I'm, I'm poaching on Neil's turf here, actually. Um, Pierre McCain uh -huh. um, observed it in 1786... It was the first, comet, yeah, that's what, the first yeah. one that was noticed by science. But it, the reason it's got Enki's name, apparently, is because he used McCain's observation <laughs> as the first observation in the series. So through laborious mm. calculations, he was able to link it to uh, seven, from 1786, mm. where it was designated <clears throat> 2P, yeah. 1786B1, 1795, again designated 2P-1795, mm. 
v1 1805 yeah um u as 2p 1805 u1 and 1818 <clears throat> as as 2p 1818 w1 and basically he was able like like Hawley did he was able to show that these all these different designated objects were just the same comet so yeah yeah he, he's and also he always he called it McCain's comet he wouldn't accept that it was yeah. Enki would he no, I he think didn't. that's true and Roomaker comes into the story back in 1882 June the 2nd yeah. because he recovered Enki's comet <clears throat> um, and yeah. this was one of the um, it proved that the predictions were testable so of course everything was built on Edmund Hawley's um, predictions for his comet um, which was recovered in 1780 sorry 1758 so hence it was P1 Hawley and then P and 2P Enki mm. but yes yeah, definitely an interesting comet as I say it can be a real whatever to to image at times but I, I shall still I'm going to be going for it again this year um not uh, not for my home setup, but uh, definitely using uh, robotic scopes. And if I can master ACP, I should definitely use some other use quite a few scopes. Yeah. <laughs> the tricky, the tricky like, part uh, with the remote scopes, so though, you you um, they don't give you much elevation, mm. but you can't go down to about ten degrees. It's like it's twenty twenty degree <coughs> minimum. Yeah, so, so it can be yeah. tricky to use remote scopes. Yeah. But uh, um, yeah. Uh, so you've got to rely on um, imaging deep into the twilight. Mm. Yeah, it, it, it just do a lot of stacking as well, and lots of flats and lots of darks. Oh boy, I already hate so it's that. actually <laughs> actually looking quite good for uh, mid July mm. for the southern hemisphere anyway. Oh well, I shall definitely be trying. With, there's, uh, there's at least one scope in Chile I can use. Um, so I should be at, I should be on that, trying to work it. Um, so before we before we wrap the show up, shall we just see if there's any other good prospects for the rest of the year for the southern or um, northern did, hemispheres? So did one of you want to talk about 2020 G1 discovery as well? Yeah. We haven't. Oh. Have we done that? I've got, yeah, that, that was a that um, that's that's oh. an amateur find. Yeah, yeah so I've, I've on the seabed, and um, oddly enough, it's a 0.28 centimeter f 2.2, and I think I've got one of those scopes as well. Yeah, they have a they have a RASA 11 as well, Michael. They've yeah. got a couple of scopes. So, and that was a pretty faint detection at 15th mag. Yeah, so, although I had a, I was quite surprised it showed up on um, just just find a finding exposures you know locating exposures when I the other night so you, you know it showed up in an eight second exposure without too much trouble so it, it was a rather bright I mean 15 yeah, magnitude the one, isn't it? is bright the lion? yes yeah it is yeah yeah and it's also in the milky it's also in the milky way area and there's plenty of stars in that mm. that yeah. part of the sky it's, it's it's a lot harder to find faint comets in in milky way regions yep Certainly do, is. Do we think this? I mean, this is a short period uh, comet. So, do we think this one may have um, maybe in a little bit of an outburst to be that sort of magnitude? I mean, it's not particularly oh, close. No, it's to pretty Earth. pretty yeah. tiny. <laughs> it's, it, yeah. it won't get any brighter than what it is now. No, it's already past its um, point five. Yeah. The question is: is it was quite a bit brighter uh, um, back in March? But I don't know if there's been any. Um, I don't know about the elongation. I think elongation would have been the thing that would have prevented its detection up until this yeah. point. Yeah. Is it pretty low yeah. as it is? Yeah, pretty low. Yeah. And it also it also has close approaches to Jupiter too. So um, as 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 lots of short period comets do. That's that's what Jupiter does. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, I'm looking on um, Yosichi's site at the moment for uh, Pimentel. Um, mm. 15.2, um, Southern Observatory <coughs> for Near Earth Research in Oliveira, Brazil. So, 
Yeah, Christopher's. Yeah. Part of the a... world. Yeah. It? Mr. Jacks. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had had them on the show at all? Yeah. Yeah. You have, have a- you? A- ages ago. Yeah, we had him on. Yeah. Christopher. Yeah. That, that, that's when I started because uh, I, I I friended him on Facebook first, um, and then we had him on the show. Um, I, I I chat to him every now and again. Did he just answer our questions, though? Um, no, I can't. He, he, I can't remember. He talked about he? he talked about the setup and everything. Oh, ah, that must have been a very early show then, because uh, uh, probably when he discovered E three or the other one, which did a little bit better before that. Yeah, I'm just just trying to go into my drive because, yes, believe it or not, I actually have a lot of the old shows. Mm. And I've started to put them up. I've been a little bit. Oh, there we go, new folder. Uh, uh, let's see what I can find. Uh, cool, yeah. This, is, this has got to be going back four or five years. So, you, yeah. We're talking about the Jacks. Yeah. Yeah. It was a 2014 E2. Oh, E2, yeah. Yeah, that was a year in July 2014. About sixth Meg. That's the one. I remember seeing that one well. Yeah, definitely. That was a, that was a nice one. That was a nice one. Yeah, I've got a nice picture of that one. Yeah, that was good. And the incredible thing about that, in stereo A imager, that um, that had a phenomenal tail, 20, 30 degree long. So, so bad, sadly, it was in a bad position with Earth, but in a very yeah. good position with stereo. Yeah, so it was a great comet in, um, from stereo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty yeah. much. <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 kind of strange because I'm, I'm actually seeing the history of the, of the show right now. Um, oh. the, the, we Comet Watch the podcast started out as Comet Tales, it, uh, part of a broadcast by Astronomy FM uh, from Under British Skies. Um, they used to then also do it as a filler segment as well. And I actually found some of my originals. And I felt very yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, I still miss Yeah, I still miss Our first mis- show was in, um, what was it, uh, the 15th or 12th of January 2015 of this show. Is yeah. that right? Yeah. Cause, Something uh, like that. I mean, cause I've actually just looked at it a second again. Because yeah. we actually quoted Kosh from Babylon 5. Um, and so really? it begins. <laughs> oh, <Okay, yeah. laughs> oh, that was a long time ago there. That was yeah, about 20 well, minutes. Ironically, I don't know uh, what's the time in England now. It's about God only knows. Just gone one o'clock in the morning. I'm not normally up this late. Oh. I, think, you know, I know. Uh, I'm an astronomer. And I don't stay up this late. Unbelievable. <laughs> and <laughs> here uh, we go, Neil. Our first show. Uh, our first show was 2015. 2015-01-12. was the very first. And it was about 20, 22 minutes. About that. 19, yeah. 20. 22 minutes. And now we're clocking in about 12 hours. <laughs> We're, <laughs> two hours, twelve, Carrie, two minutes. Yeah, I was going to say, Carrie and, My- and Michael have now lost their breakfast, and they're going to move straight on <laughs> to brunch. Brunch. Uh, uh, you, hey, if you're going to go for the brunch, guys, get the Barbie out. That's all I can say. Get yeah. the Barbie out. Put the shrimp on the Barbie. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen a shrimp. I don't think I've ever seen a shrimp on the Barbie ever. <laughs> What's a shrimp? Uh, it kind of looks like a prawn. <laughs> so what time does the sun set in Australia? <laughs> Five o'clock in the afternoon your time? Or... I don't know. Oh, what time? 30-ish. Something like that, yeah. Six, yeah. About eight o'clock here now, I think. Just gone eight o'clock at night here. Bloody summertime. <laughs> I know, you've got to stay it up super late now. <laughs> two minutes past midnight UTC. Yeah, well, in England it's not. It's two minutes past bleeding one. <laughs> well, speak for yourself, Neil, uh-huh. because my, my computers all stay on uh, GMT or UTC. Uh-huh. I'm going to do my breakfast in a minute. <laughs> I mean, about eight meals a day at the moment. I just want munchies all the time. <laughs> Thank God I've still got the chocolate Easter eggs for the children. I was tucking them in a minute. Um, <laughs> it's sugar rush. On, the Lucas on May the 1st, 2016, uh, we were speak. We were down under again, according to the show list. 
Um, this, on, in June of 2016, it was called North Meet South. Um, Rodney, Rod, speaking of Rodney, um, Rodney was our guest on the 08, 08, 08, 08, 16, 1608, uh, 2015, 2015. And I think that was with Terry, wasn't it? I swear it was. It was one I did with, with uh, Rodney. Yeah. 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 I swear. Yep. Yeah, got to be that one, I think. Yeah. We've, we've keep, had some keep people. Keep reminding I mean, him, don't. Don't keep reminding him of the 1990 comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I made a reference about astronomy in the old days, and I'm like, oh my god, because I like yeah. primi- I saw I like, was he's about 300 years old. And he'd seen all the great comets with his own eyes. I remember that. Yeah, you oh, find yeah, that I funny. Think he, I think he <laughs> said he saw the um, great comet of 1947. Yeah. Forty-eight. Nice. We had we had two southern comets, uh, one in forty-seven, forty-eight. Yeah, so, I remember him. About that, yeah, I think we did Alan Hale at some point, and I think Alan was Jim quite Scott, early. Alan, Alan was yeah. quite early. I mean, Jim Scott. He's been on so many times now. He's basically a member of the team, isn't he? Uh, yeah. uh, Rich, uh, Rich Kowalski, twenty seventeen, yeah. oh four nineteen. Mm-hmm. Um, Wendy Clark joined us back on 20, in 2018. Wow. Um, Bill Bradfield. Um, I don't think we had Bill. Yes, we did. I've got. We a show had here. Bill Bradfield. I have a show here that think... says it was him. Just you and me, Neil, that interviewed him. As about the pass, the passing of Bill Bradfield. Yeah. Yes, say he the Bill passed away. The uh, passing of Bill Bradfield. Yeah. yeah. Um, we had Richard Miles join us in 2016. Yeah. Um, 29P was, of course, obviously the subject. And I, I think we amused him with my la- my terrible pronunciation. I used to call it SW1 and 73P, SW2. Yeah. And one person Anything asked me... Like... Sorry, carry on. <laughs> one person asked me, why, why was I giving a London postcode? That's right. That's <laughs> <fun>. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Southwest twenty nine. Uh, in fact, Richard came back again. Um, oh, did he? Yeah, twenty seventeen, February the sixteenth. And we've had Michael on as well. Yeah. And uh, Michael uh, Dennis. I think you yeah. had a stomach upset, Michael, the last time. Did you I? Long I think you did. I think you'd been ill. I think you'd you obviously won these shrimps on the barbie or whatever you eat in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Probably had to be on. <laughs> Oysters yeah. on the Barbie, I think it was. Wasn't it? Yeah, something like that. Well, yeah. we, we did a special with Terry about his comet number six. And Which that one was, was that? That was, uh, that was March 2017. Oh. Yeah. Oh, was it? Oh, yes. The E. The E comet. 2017 E4, I think it was. Or E2. Yeah. Or... Okay. Did that I should disintegrate? Know, shouldn't I? Oh. Did that one disintegrate? Yes. That's the one. Yeah, E4 it remember. was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought uh, that one was a bit of a disappointment. That one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that one. It's gonna. Yeah, that's that what one. Swan's gonna. That's what Swan's gonna do. It's gonna fizz out. It's gonna be oh, a disappointment. No, we don't want that. <laughs> wait, 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 till, wait till you see the predictions from magnitude minus five first before it fizzles. <laughs> 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 that, it's going to be a minus 30 magnitude job. It has to be, doesn't it? Chris Wyatt, get out of your ice and sun cream. There you go. I've, I've mentioned Chris twice now. He'll be well chuffed with that. He'll, he'll be chuffed. He'll be You've well chuffed. You've got to get chuffed. him on board. You should we've had him. Chris, I think. I think we had Chris once. Yeah, we've yeah. had Chris on board. Uh, I don't think you want to come back again. No, I'm only joking. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, we did have Chris once. Yeah, he tried to knock me off some ice and sun cream. He's, he's, <laughs> he's, yeah, he's a bit... Bit of a shady character that man, I don't know. He okay. won't mind me saying that. And saying that we <laughs> had uh, John Coleshaw on whose impersonation has really kept us laughing. And that yes, was uh, John that was February twenty seventeen. And we had Donna Burton, uh from Siding Spring at the or was yep. it Siding, not Siding Spring at the time, but talking about her comet. Yes, I remember that one well. Four days later we did the uh, special with Terry about comet number six. Yeah. We've been trying to get Rob McNaught, but we couldn't f- sort of get in contact with him, could we? We haven't had any luck there. 
after Sidon Spring thing, he sort of like just couldn't get hold of him, could we? But, uh, yeah. Are we reminiscing now and just killing time to make this as long as show history? <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm trying I, to break the uh, record. <laughs> uh, we're, at, uh, ni- we're at two hours, 19 minutes already. So we've so um, broken the record yet? Yeah, we broke it. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Done it. That's cool. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Congratulations. Uh, I just, I'll just wait until, until I get muttered at um, in uh, special characters. Because <laughs> uh, yeah. that should be interesting. Well, I know if I, I know I'm going to upload the show to AFM anyway, but it'll be out on, on YouTube and we can all distribute it um, then. And actually, Michael, have you, had, um, have you heard from Rob? No, I haven't. Recently? No. No, no. So you guys to do this contact um Rob. Yeah, but yeah, we should. Yeah, we need to we need to get him on with you guys. So somebody uh was talking about um the Halley uh affiliate party too. Mm. I think yeah. Halley, Halley, uh twenty twenty three. Yeah, I like yeah, yeah. that group as well. Yes. So that that'll be a special occasion. Oh, we will still it be will. here. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with these pandemics that keep well, That's right. <laughs> <laughs> these pandemics that oh. are globally spreading. I, I, actually, I thought you meant uh, we should try and keep the show running until twenty twenty. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah, I can imagine the upload on that one. <laughs> the, the comments in the group. Well, what, there will the show. Be, we were trying to do there, it in 2023. Oh, no, there will be a cure for coronavirus by the time the show ends. Well, well, well you've already got antibodies. You've already got antibodies, so you're safe. We're not. Yes, <laughs> Mary, Australia, me and Mary, we're not safe. No, we have the cure. Me and Mary have the cure. You've got the, the cure, yeah. We need, we need some of your serum. We need you to donate your serum. <laughs> well, well, we're uh, right. First of all, Nicole, I think we'll talk about that off air. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. Yeah, blood orange skin is a good. Uh, T- tell you what, what we'll yeah. do, we'll, we'll bring up one of our our, our beloved questions. Um, since both of you are on the show this week, this month, um, you've got an unlimited fund. Where would you send a space probe, and what would you want to, want to look for? I'd I'd go for twenty nine p. Yep, yep, double that twenty nine p, definitely. I think yeah. NASA better watch out. There's so many of us now uh, angling for 29p. Um, <laughs> we are, aren't we? Oh, yes, um, most definitely. And then, um, because I've got unlimited budget, uh, I'd probably Halley, Halley at Apenian. Halley at Apenian. Mm-hmm. Mm, yes. Maybe a, a, a new comet, a, 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 a dynamically new comet. That would be interesting. Something that hasn't been around the inner solar system. But I think we're covering that anyway. Or well, the trying to yeah, cover. Hopefully the interceptor will do that. Oh, yes. Yep. But 29p, we definitely have to get something there. I, I think the nice thing about the interceptor mission is if we get an, another interstellar visitor, um, comet at least, we've got something, well, we should have something in place, hopefully, um, to actually go and look at it close up. Um, NASA tells, tells us that their ion engine is is the bee's knees. Um, so, yep, tack that on. Hopefully, to yeah. Hopefully, this interceptor has something to go to intercept. Mm. <laughs> I thought you were going to say. Hopefully, hopefully, it's got a warp drive to chase the interstellar. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, with uh, um, the last synoptic survey coming on board we might actually have a chance of finding a comet far enough earlier yeah yeah. earlier that we can actually plan a mission to Mm -hmm. well there's a big one coming in at the moment k2 uh, 2017 k2 pan stars that's that's got a that's a very large nucleus on that one yep um was that due due in december 20 2022 yeah that's right i've forgotten about that Mm. yeah that's got an absolute mega of about one Yep. So yeah, it's that's in the big big range, but it's not. Problem is, it's not very close to the sun. It's only about one point eight AU yeah. at close approach, which is quite quite distant. But that might be that might be an option for the inter- interceptor mission. Yeah. Mhm. 
Oh. Although that's, that's in two years' time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And apart, uh, and with the funds left over, I'd probably get an island somewhere. <laughs> and, uh... <laughs> oh, yeah. Siphon off the funds. Yeah, the and a Lamborghini. <laughs> and, uh... Yeah, siphon the funds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shrewd operator, as the song goes. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, we're in the middle of July now, so I think we've... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Here's Tom and Enki. Enki's come and gone. Um... <laughs> <laughs> we got we got Comet uh, Ponds Brooks and Comet Olbers coming up too the next yeah. few yeah. years. Yep, 20 Ponds Brooks. That's that was my uh, that was my next when when I saw Halley's in '86 I said what what's the next great periodic comet and yeah. uh, 12P popped on the list I said ooh I have to wait till 2024 to see that thing yep. and that's fast approaching yeah I think um, there's is. another one that nobody talks about that's in a Halley type orbit which is um, Mellish comet Mellish the one that appeared in 1917 that's meant to be returning um, around the 20, return of Halley. Yeah, 2061 so, period, yeah, in that area. So it, it's got a period of about 140 years, but it was um, it was very bright in 1917, so it has a relatively small... Um, perihelion distance. Uh, perihelion. And on the way out, um, it had... 20 degree tail and quite a bright dust tail too so it, it, it's quite a good comet if, if, if we're all around 2060 <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah so yeah, from the safety, I, I, I want to hang around to see Comet Thatcher the, the one responsible wow. for the Laura media shower that's pushing it a bit <laughs> it, is, it, is, it is pushing it yeah, you'll be. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm old. not sure when that's returning, but uh... 22 something, I think. I, I is it is it 20 22 something? I swear it is. I just thought I did a bit of writing about that the other day. I can't remember. I think it has about a 400 year period ish, 450 years. Somebody's looking now on Google. Obviously, well they? beyond their times. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, maybe 61 G one. Uh, 1861 G1, wasn't it? Something like yeah. that. Uh, it says so, here, sorry, it says here, sorry, Michael, you won't see it. 400 oh, years. 200 years or more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 450 year orbit. Um, it's responsible Unless I'm reincarnated. Yeah. If I'm reincarnated. You'll probably actually yep. see the other 1861 comet before then. Um, <laughs> the Great Comet, Tabbit. Well, it probably yeah. actually mm -hmm. before yeah. that. Um, <laughs> actually, his perihelion for Thatcher is uh, twenty-two eighty plus or minus five years. Ah, oh, there you go. I uh, yeah. I don't think so. We could be on the phone until then. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> However, I will add, we do see Comet Thatcher every year. It's the Lunar Shower. You do. See it Thatcher yeah. every year, yep. Being technical again. Technically. <laughs> what we do, the paper is an excuse to say Comet Thatcher will light up the sky. <laughs> That's right. You see, That's what happens. <laughs> Actually, um... Uh, uh, Eighteen sixty-one J is predicted to return in twenty-two sixty-five. Twenty-two sixty-five. Yep. Yeah. Nope. Still no, not going to make that. I won't be here then. Oh. <laughs> 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 no chance. Uh, um. Yeah. Okay. Zhang will return about then. <laughs> Actually, we have um, interesting. I uh, don't know if you remember Akaya Zhang. Um, yes. Zeng? Zeng? Yeah. Was, um, Zeng. Um, 
So it was a return of the 1661 comet. Now, there was a brighter comet that appeared in 1532 that has an almost identical orbit. Yeah. And, and there's speculation that they um, have the same parent body, so they're, they're fragments. And so there's speculation mm. that the 1532 comet might return in the mm. near future. Ooh, so definitely one to keep eye open for. <laughs> Just throwing it out there's long shots. <laughs> things that yeah. we might actually see in our lifetime. We could see these things. It would so, be nice. I mean, I... I spoke to somebody the other day, I uh, can't remember who, but they uh, basically we kind of agreed that Hale-Bopp was the comet of our time, of our generation. It probably we won't get anything. I mean, I mean, for example, I mean, the nearest comet to Hale-Bopp in terms of longevity in the sky and was like 1811. Uh, so you look at the huge time spans. I mean, I know one could be found tomorrow or, you know, but the odds of that i mean if you go by you know statistics we have seen the best we're going to see probably if you're going to be realistic about it that is you know yeah maybe visually but i suppose we're lucky that with the imaging equipment we've got access to you can like you said earlier you can still make them look pretty awesome <laughs> oh, i think yeah. you'll get a um if you <laughs> get something like mcnaught up north you might change your <laughs> um, right. So if you see, because you want one that's like McNaught, that's bright, that doesn't have to, mm -hmm. um, that can contend with twilight and uh, light yeah. pollution. That's uh, the trouble with McNaught for us was always very low and in twilight. I mean, it was there, but it's just, you know, it, it was, certainly wasn't the spectacle the Australian and Southern Hemisphere and New Zealand, it, you know, you guys had. Uh, we need another. It hadn't, developed, it hadn't developed the length of tail, but you know. No. Uh, yeah, so you never know. We might not have seen yeah. the best. Yeah, but, but Comet Halley though. That was, no, no, sorry, Hale Bop was was probably one of the longest naked eye periods of yeah. observing. I'm not sure whether it was close to a year or something. Who knows? Was that, was I think we worked eighteen periods. months. Eighteen months. Yeah, we worked yeah. out. And this, the, the one that's coming in, K2, 2017 K2 pan stars, that's, that's going to be probably naked eye for, for a certain period because that's, yes. that's, it's got big absolute, large, large absolute magnitude, so it should be visible for, for months, naked eye, although it won't be bright naked eye, probably going to be faint. But is, is that one an, an orc cloud? Is a, yeah, it's an orc cloud one. Yeah, yeah, that's an orc cloud one too, so that's a bit risky. On, yeah, on they, they're all yeah, risky propositions, aren't they? Yeah. Yep. Definitely, anything can happen with those, <laughs> good or bad. Yeah, but yeah, I thought uh, I thought actually uh, McNaught P one was an Oort cloud object too. So it yeah, was. Never know. You never know. Mm -hmm. No, very they true. Do, as, I said, um, as I said, they knock a box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wasn't it um, Sally Fields that said that in the movie? Life's like a box of chocolates. <clears throat> yeah. It was Forrest Gump. Yes, that was. Forrest Gump. Uh, Forrest Gump, yeah. Actually, uh, uh, he, he brought um, coronavirus into Australia, you know. That was his other claim to fame. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, of course. Oh, yes. So, oh, Mr. Hank, off top, why did you go to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you I know think what? he's doing a movie about Elvis Presley, wasn't he? Oh, yes, sorry, Nick. Yes, he was. I was actually going to say, well, I think we need to let these two guys go get their breakfast because they've been really great. It's been a good long show. Yes. I'm probably going to get complaints about Absolutely. the length of it. I don't care. Uh, we've had a good time. and It's always good it's having marathon. having Michael and it's Terry marathon. on. Cause, uh, marathon. Yeah. It's, it's good fun. Uh, I, we, I don't think we got started on the language, though. Did we, Michael? <laughs> the language. <laughs> <laughs> that would have come. That would have come in another half an hour or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair dinkum. <laughs> <laughs> fair suck of the sand. Oh. <laughs> I haven't heard but fair dinkum like in nearly uh, thirty years. Two episodes of Home and Away. <laughs> I heard that. Two episodes of Home and Away and one episode of Neighbours. <laughs> Susan Kennedy. 
Was it Susan Kennedy or the one like uh, Carl Kennedy? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> He's, I think, um, anyway, I think Neil, loves to call him a note. And Jason Donovan, I'm doing Ooh. all the stereotypes now. <laughs> Kay, 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 Kylie, Nicole Kidman. Know. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman. I knew it was something like yeah, yeah, yeah. Kylie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and other ACDC. Uh, send my love to Angus. Uh, I love They're Angus. Scottish anyway. <laughs> oh yeah, I've got that. Um, <laughs> anybody else know Australian? We'll take it. We'll take it. Paul Hogan, <laughs> uh, Steve Irwin. <laughs> Uh, St- Russell Crowe is definitely yeah. New Zealand, so <laughs> we'll just might point that out. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Rodney Oss. Oh, no, he's New Zealander. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. About, I, about I, four. I, th- I think with Neil completely losing it, uh, I think this is probably the best time to actually wind up the show, folks. Neil is Neil is losing it. <laughs> Neil yeah, sorry, broken. But... Yeah, I've broken. We're broken now. Yes. Uh, well, pleasure, guys. Pleasure. It's, it's been good fun. Yeah, yeah. it's, all it's been say. fun. Thanks. Thanks for having us on. And I will Absolutely. send you. I will send you a copy of the show as usual through Skype. Um, <laughs> and I, I will get this up tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm probably going to get yelled at because I'll be hogging a fair bit of the bandwidth. But do I care? Not a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> so, nope. Michael, Terry, brilliant having you on as usual. So it's, it's been great fun. Nice, and that's that's what I like about doing this. You guys, you have a great sense of humour, and it really comes out when we're talking about comets and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Even if Neil does okay. lose the plot. <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry about that, but I, I, I won't get started. I I mean, we've been in lockdown so long, I don't know what day of the week it is. I don't know why I'm living with the people I'm living with. I... <laughs> it's Sunday, mate. I don't care anymore. <laughs> Get some sunshine. you got you got summer coming up soon. This is England. Have you Have ever you been, been to England? to the UK? <laughs> we get sunshine. What's the problem? Yeah, I got sunburned last weekend, but that's probably it now till August. <laughs> that's good. That's all right. As long as you get your vitamin D, that's the main thing. Yeah. This is English, <laughs> Michael. <at> <laughs> we don't have vitamin D. We don't even know what the sun looks like half the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Anyway. Watch, if you watch East Dead or Coronation Street, you'll see what we're talking about. It is just grey. Anyway, Nick, are you going to say goodnight to us, Because you're hanging us on. Yes, I'm going I'm to say, I think it's probably the best point is to say goodnight right now. Um, because unfortunately I can't reach down over the internet and put a gag on Neil. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say good night, everybody. Thank you for coming, everyone. It's been brilliant, and I'm going to have fun editing the show and putting all these pictures in and make people insanely jealous. Yeah. And hope we have a naked eye comet to observe at least one. But, Absolutely. Uh, yeah, fingers Absolutely. crossed. Absolutely, yes. Yes. Good luck, good luck. We're going to need it. Good luck with Y4 when we send it your way as well, Michael. <laughs> you said us, send us the trash. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Neil, sign off. Yeah. Oh, uh, good night, everybody. God bless, and um, oh, I love everybody. Uru from Australia. <laughs> the quote somebody else, peace, love, and telescopes, and comets. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Good, good suggestion. Okay. Right, goodbye, everyone. Stay safe. Goodbye. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>